this hangout is live on air. I'm just going to wait to see, get that little, the, 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 it's go from the chat room that everything is five by five. We are live. That's right. There we go. So it is time to start the show in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 711, recorded on Wednesday, March 6, 2019. We are probiotics. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your head with more heads, heavy sound, and spiders. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. We live in interesting times. Not that other times weren't equally as interesting, but it is a specifically interesting time if you happen to be a human. For one, humans weren't always around, so just being on the planet now is in and of itself an interesting thing. For another, despite all of the interesting times in which were, there were humans on the planet, this time is perhaps the most interesting. Not because humans are in and of themselves more interesting now than humans of the past, but because our access to interesting information is greater than at any other time in human history. And this, as it turns out, means that times are likely to just keep getting more interesting as the time goes by, making this moment just a little less interesting than the next one to come. Or in this case, the moment spent listening to a protracted, prolonged, show intro will be a lot less interesting than This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening. Science. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Good science, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science, bringing you all the science news that we have found, that we love, enjoy, want to share with you this week. There are so many wonderful tidbits. I am just excited for the conversation. I brought stories about, what did I bring stories about? I brought stories about regeneration. And we have an interview about probiotics for the ocean, which is going to be very exciting. Justin, what did you bring? Uh, uh, let's see. I've got the dangers of dog walking. Uh, <laughs> And something else. Oh, uh, yeah. Does sound carry mass? I'm sure you're going to answer that question. Oh, I, that was my during question. The show. I was just, oh, it was just oh, a question. Oh, <laughs> so I, I, was, I was just like hoping somebody knew. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have spiders that look like ants. I have bachelor dolphins. And I have Wikipedia saving species. Hmm. Wikipedia, interesting. We know it's it's good for 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 lots now. Interesting. Okay, well, let's jump into the show. I would love to remind you, as we do, that if you are not yet subscribed to this week in science, you can find full episodes at twist t w i s dot org, and all places that podcasts are found. Also, YouTube and Facebook, if you're interested, and if you are in the Portland, Oregon area. For April 3rd, we will be broadcasting our podcast live at the Alberta Rose Theater. Check our website for information. All right, let's jump into the interview. I would love to introduce our guest, Dr. Ra Raquel Pachotto. Dr. Pachotto is a visiting assistant professor at UC Davis from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and a research associate from the Rio de Janeiro Marine Aquarium, Aquario, 
in Brazil. She also coordinates the beneficial microorganisms of marine organ marine organisms, the BMMO network, which seeks to unify and facilitate studies on the manipulation of the microbiome associated with marine organisms. Dr. Peixoto, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's exciting to be here. We're excited to have you. And uh, like we were talking about before the show started, this was this chain of events of introductions of you just need to invite her onto the show. <laughs> Justin was told. So Justin told me and then I reached out to you and now you're here. So yeah. uh, if there's a huge amount of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. No, absolutely. It is because uh, it's something that I didn't know until Blair brought it to the attention of the show is that half of the oxygen on planet Earth isn't coming from rainforests, isn't just already there. It's being generated by the coral reef system. And so if, working on ways to preserve a coral reef is even more pressure because it's maybe the fate of humanity that's in your hands. Yeah, more or less. I mean, the bacteria, the microorganisms are providing uh, this huge amount of oxygen, but there are several other things that the corals are very important. For instance, they protect the coast against waves and storms and, and things like that. They produce, they are responsible for uh, most of the, uh, the, the economy, for the economy of many countries that depend on fisheries and tourism, tourism and every other activities associated with corals, diving. Uh, they are a source of cure for several di uh, diseases because of the huge amount of biodiversity. And most importantly, uh, more than 25% of the marine species depend on coral reefs so and they are also associated and interacting with several of all other marine ecosystems with terrestrial environment so they are really important <laughs> so, yeah, yeah they're very the important you've taken on their preservation it's absolutely more important than any pressure that you could feel for just for, for yeah, joining our yeah, show. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a huge pressure when people ask me, can probiotics save coral reefs? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm trying to <laughs> figure it out. I think that maybe they can contribute uh, for sure, at least for us to understand more about the relationships that we see within corals, because corals as us, they are not alone. They have this microbiome, this community of microorganisms associated that is very important for their fitness, for their health. So we are trying to understand how and manipulate it. How did you get interested in this question? I mean, how did you how did you get into this specific area of study? Uh, this is kind of interesting. I start working with soil and plants mm -hmm. and the manipulation of microbiomes of plants. So trying to find bacteria that could protect plants against disease. So biological control of uh, diseases in plants. And uh, during my this, that was my uh, the focus of my PhD thesis. And then when I start uh, my postdoc, I start working with a similar thing. But then I moved to the mangroves. Mangroves are uh, areas of intersection between the terrestrial and the marine environment. So I kind of think I came from mm. the soil. I went to the mangroves and I start working with a bioremediation of polluted mangroves, uh, oil uh, impacted mangroves. And that is very interesting because we start working with a bacteria that, that could degrade oil to protect mangroves. And with this very polluted, highly polluted mangrove in Brazil uh, that the oil company wanted to turn into a parking lot and mm. <laughs> because they couldn't revegetate this mangrove. It was extremely polluted and they came to us to ask if we could find a solution uh, like a bioremediation approach to to make it uh, possible to revegetate this mangrove we went there and our first thought was oh my gosh i don't think so but <laughs> <laughs> let's try it and then we selected some bacteria that could degrade the oil and we first before going to the field so long uh, story short we we thought that we needed um different strategy because in mangroves we have the tides that could wash our probiotics in this case our oil degrading bacteria so we developed like bacterial pills that could slowly release this bacteria for a while and that could absorb 
in the in the sediments of this mangrove, and we tested it in the in the in the plants in the small plants in the greenhouse, but then we realized that our uh, oil degrading bacteria were also uh, plant growth promoting bacteria that are very well known and explored for agricultural systems and they thought that we could use this and uh, and take advantage of it because we could make plant the plants healthier and at the same time we could treat the contamination so we managed to revegetate this mangrove this pilot area using our bacteria it was awesome nice. yeah, yeah cool. and at this at the same time i started working with corals and I thought a, a coral bioremediation, and I thought that I could try to move and use a similar approach. And that's how I ended up working with coral probiotics. <laughs> so we know that you know, that the coral are these symbiotic organisms, where the zooxanthellae, the these little organism microorganisms within the corals, um, are are working together, and it's it, it's it's an it, seems like an incredibly complex ecosystem like what how much do we know about like beyond zooxanthellae about ah, the microorganisms in this environment very good question uh the first thing that I, the first thing that i realized when i tried to find the probiotics is that we we know very little about it we know more about and even though we don't know enough about the, the zooxanthellae association with the corals, but the thing is that there are several other groups that are interacting not only with the corals, but within each other and also with the zooxanthellae. And I went, that's how everything started, because I went to the literature and I found some isolated papers showing some beneficial mechanisms that the, the, the bacteria or the microorganisms could offer to corals. And then we put them all together and we coined this name, this, uh, this term beneficial microorganisms for corals, the BMCs, that would be the specific probiotics for corals. And we know something about them, but we are still trying to figure out how the connections and how they respond to stress how they protect corals and that's why it's so interesting also to work with probiotics because when we manipulate it when we manipulate the conditions and we test it over time we can see how these mechanisms are affected and how they affect corals when we have corals protected or not and then the, the all the the, the the whole idea uh, behind the, the de development of probiotics. It's not only to protect corals, but also to understand more about all these complex interactions. I mean, there are several mechanisms that we know and way more that we don't know. <laughs> and we are trying to figure out. I, yeah, I mean, we've got such a, I mean, thinking about the microbiota for humans and people are like, I'm going to eat yogurt, you know, yes. but... <laughs> We don't know how much that helps or doesn't help. Or, you know, it's like one kind of bacteria when we have hundreds to thousands in each of us, right? Yeah. So, and every day we have different and no and new knowledge about it, new papers, new studies coming out showing that even our behavior can be affected or mm -hmm. that different behaviors are highly connected or correlated with shifts in this uh, microbiome our gut microbiome so we are still learning we know that something's going on i mean they at least respond to those uh stresses and at some level we know that mecha some mechanisms are actively uh promoted by this microbiome so why not try to to use it in our favor. And as for the yogurt, it's more or less the same thing. Uh, the thing that we are trying to do is trying, we are trying to give yogurt to corals to protect them, make them healthier, <laughs> to resist uh, global change and, and other, I mean, several different impacts. So, so, my, so I was wondering about specifically what we are trying to help with um, with the the probiotics for the coral because I know it's kind of this mixed bag of stressors is what we're dealing with right now right yes. so we yeah. have ocean acidification we have uh, we have acidity issues we have sea level rise so there's less sun getting to the bottom of the corals there's wa a water temperature change there's um, sunscreen in the water that are hurting yeah, their ability yeah. to photosynthesize. So corals have this kind of mixed bag of different threats. What particularly are we trying to help with a 
with a probiotic? So uh, we have different uh, aims, specific aims in the lab and different uh, research going on. But the whole idea is more or less that if you use probiotics, you are not necessarily focusing only one stressor because mm. the idea is that you make the organism healthier and then it can resist any different uh, types of stress. So uh, this is more or less what we try, because we were at that point when I moved from the mangrove to curls, we were trying to focus on oil. We are trying to develop a biomediation approach to protect them uh, against oil spews. And at that point, we thought, because of the plant experience, uh, our experience with plants in mangroves, we thought that, well, we can definitely focus on the oil degradation, but we can add some other things that could improve the fitness of these corals because it's just like us. If you are healthier, we are more resistant against disease or against any other stressors. So it's more or less the same idea, but uh, we use this general idea and we add some specific components for different, because we work with consortium uh, consortia of bacteria for different uh, mechanisms or different aims. So basically now we have this background of things that we think that could promote health, make them stronger. Like if you have more nutrients, if you have, if you can cope uh, with some stresses like um, uh, oxidative stress or other things, you are healthier. And then we can add things. For instance, now we have uh, some studies going on uh, to protect them against specific pathogens. So we add mm -hmm. uh, bacteria that are natural antagonistic to, a, to that specific uh, uh, pathogen. We are also trying to develop some strategy to make them grow, to promote coral growth, because that could be used in coral nurseries for restoration approach. So if can if you can make them grow faster, then we can take some time and we can go for the restoration approach itself uh, faster. And as a secondary effect mm -hmm. that we really want to see is that maybe we can also uh, contribute to carbon sequestration. If you make them grow faster, they can sequestrate carbon and act as storage. And so it's a win-win strategy if you can make it. When you're looking for specific bacteria or the, that make up the populations that they're that are naturally in the coral and the one and bacteria that you might want to be adding, how do you go about doing it? Is it a, a data heavy genomics approach, or a, are you are you sampling and I, how how does it work? How do you make I mean, it, you so figure far, it all out? <laughs> so far, we isolated native bacteria from the coral species that we, the, the two species that we are working with. Uh, we isolated this bacteria, so we have a bunch of uh, cultures, and then we go and we test we test them uh, for different uh, mechanisms. This screening uh, process that we go to look at the genes at, uh, in some cases and the phenotype in others. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we test the production of catalase that can be a very good antioxidant uh, thing that we want to use, compound that we want to use. So we test it and we check for the best producers of catalase. This is a phenotypic test that we do. We can also look at the genome or we can test for different or specific genes uh, using PCR. For instance, if they fix nitrogen, if they, they, have, if they, they, they degrade the MSP or other things that we want to see, so we combine those different things. In some cases, we also look at the microbiome that we know. We know more or less the core microbiome of that coral. And we try to tech, to also use some of the dominant members that we think that could be there for some reason. And so we, at this point, we are kind of combining things. We used to say that we are kind of, uh, an, uh, it's alchemy. It's kind of Gandalf, let's use this and that. No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding, but I mean, yeah. we have this, level of knowledge that we want to add and at some point we have to decide the things that we think that that for that specific aim it's more interesting to use what's sort of interesting to me too is that it's you're you're almost like creating the medicine of coral reefs from the microbiome out I and mean, it just i like I, I keep thinking what if we had done this in humans <laughs> what if we had like started with the microbiome in humans and then we're like, oh, okay, well, once we have this microbiome load, we have these different affects in behavior or in ailment. And it's a really fascinating approach in that direction. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think that people are trying to develop things like that for humans, specific. Uh, one thing that it's interesting to mention is that at some point, some people started to talk about probiotics, and it was very, I mean, a hot uh, topic. Everybody, everybody was talking about this, and people start using it randomly, like with no specific mm -hmm. selection of. Oh, uh, I have features. I have several probiotics that I uh, that I offer through this show. <laughs> that are just microbes that I like. That's okay. I'm for them. Yeah, but <laughs> there's nothing. There's no evidence or any trials behind it. I just yeah. like those. I'm I'm really pro certain probiotic. Microbes, so. Most <laughs> people were using probiotics like that. Some yeah. in some cases, some people get probiotics for humans and they just use for fish aquaculture or something like this. Our idea is to develop something that it's very specific. It's kind of personalized medicine for corals. That's what we want to do, and and that's why I th what I think that we should do for environmental sciences in general, not only for corals, but environmental probiotics for specific aims. When we are working with a biomediation, we know that we can't use a consortium that you use in Antarctica in Rio or in Bahia because the conditions are completely different and so the bugs won't have the same metabolism or won't be able to adapt. And so I think that if we start to think about environmental restoration, we need to accept that this is something that we have to be very specific and start to work with personalized medicine for the environment. Yeah, because the nutrients that are available uh, mm -hmm. in different places are so differing that you can't just apply a nutrient sort of specific model to, you have to know, or you have to understand the microbiome first, understand what can be processed and then maybe you can do a combination of of adding both, but uh, exactly. a nutrient alone doesn't. Yeah. Several other things will be different. Uh, I mean, Blair mentioned that some places will have other threats, not only temperature, some places will be also contaminated with oil or, or sea level rise will be a problem or anything. Like, I mean, several other things. So I think we have to look at that uh, specific area and, and go with something that it's specifically designed for it. Of course, you can have a general idea and a general thing that can be used, but we always have to adapt. Uh, and I think that we've been always working like this in Brazil for biomediation, my group uh, uh, and other collaborators, we've been trying to develop things like that that can work there. It's not necessarily the same thing that we work somewhere else. And so- But lessons yeah. learned there would inform everywhere, right? Yeah. Do do you have an area that you're you have an eye on for field trials right now in terms of coral reefs? This is a very good question. I wish I had. I mean, yes, I have several. Uh, <laughs> the only thing is that we need the permits. It's very right, right. Yeah. Uh, but one interesting thing that we have is that we are building uh, a reef from scratch at the Biosphere Two Ocean in Arizona with Diane Thompson, who is the, the leader, the director of the ocean there, and with several other colleagues. We are trying to build this co this coral reef from scratch and test different and radical approaches before we go to the field there. In this, this is the largest uh, artificial ocean in the world, and we we are going to have several uh, benefits from doing that. We're going to have all the process, the biogeochemical process, being monitored from the beginning, and going to have answers and several no I mean new knowledge about how things change over and along the way. And then when we have a very resilient reef, we are going to stress it and destroy it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that makes sense That's the though, science, right? yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. You put that, that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are going to build this, we want to build this resilient reef. And at some point we're gonna stress it out and test different solutions radical interventions before we go to the field so we can know whether this can be efficient or cause any harm to any of the species and it's, i'm super excited about it so thinking from the perspective of your Putting, going to be adding beneficial bacteria, bacteria that are beneficial to corals. We know that when even beneficial bacteria get out of balance in a population, that they can be detrimental. Yeah. So is what are the various challenges to thinking about using bacteria for coral health? Yeah, we 
we have the same concern that we are increasing the numbers. We are using native things that are beneficial, but we are increasing the numbers. Uh, one thing that we think that we see from our biomediation uh, experience is that once you have the, the, the stress, uh, we're going to use this bacteria, this high number of bacteria, they will do their job, they will fill up, especially because they won't allow the pathogens to establish. So you have high numbers of beneficial bacteria that will take care, uh, that will take over the, the, the environment. And after the situation, after the conditions turn back to the normal, the trend is that the community will also get back to the normal and get balanced. But of course, this is something that we don't know. That's what we've been seeing in tanks. And that's why you want to go to the vice field to and test before you go to the field and make a huge mess. Now, I, I don't think you're going to do <laughs> we'll just make a mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, actually, I, I do think that it's not going to happen. I think that this is the natural trend that we see in other um, environments for other approaches. And I think that the trend is that we're going to use it. We're going to avoid the pathogens to, to, to establish. We're going to to protect them by providing the beneficial uh, mechanisms. And once the, the conditions are back to normal, the community will get back to the normal balance and, yeah. and get reestablished. This seems like that must be a strong uh, natural influence to, to get to that balance because this is a microbiome that is open to the environment. You know, mm -hmm. this is a microbiome yeah. that can be carried by waves going by. Exactly. By, yeah. it, it's a microbiome that can be carried by the massive diversity of fish species that are mm -hmm. that are visiting. Mm -hmm. So not, there must a, be. It's not just an apple that you're eating. Yeah, yeah. it's not. A, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. a really a, a, a contained yeah, yeah. Uh, situation uh, to the point where yeah, it seems like it must uh, through all of the other environmental factors that are there. Be uh, ultimately will always be self regulating yeah uh, regardless of which direction we've, yeah. we've pushed it in yeah uh, but those nudges uh maybe m uh, mediate a, a specific issue for a while until it can get back to that balance that's yeah. really fascinating one thing that we are trying to do is that we eliminate all the potential known pathogens that we find so we are not using vibrios or you're not using pathogens that can be that are known for being pathogen pathogens for any species so this is part of our selection. We only select things that have never been described as pathogens to any species. So I really think that this is self-regulated and I really think that it's good. Our challenge is actually to keep the numbers high while you have the event. So yeah. that's why we are thinking about the bacterial peers that can slow release this bacteria and probably gonna have to re-inoculate it um like in our experiments we've been using like we inoculate and then we inoculate again after five or seven days and so we have the, the thermal stress happening and we have to keep the numbers high and at some point what we see is that it's self-regulated it's just something that but and and in that period then also i, I assume you're uh out competing and filling the niches that would otherwise be possibly filled by pathogens and that's mm -hmm. part of it is just a numbers game getting enough yeah. people i said microbes to move in uh to make uh it hard for anything else to to show up this is one of the theories we have we have uh, different theories we think that we can be using it and the, they are established and they are actually doing the job that we want them to do by providing that specific mechanisms it can be that they are just filling up the space and avoiding the pathogens to to establish it can be both things combined i mean that's why we now are running new experiments and we will have all the omics going on the metagenomics metatranscriptomics the microscopy and other things because now we know that we can protect them but we don't know exactly how we managed to do that and now we are going uh, deeper trying to understand where they're establishing how they are uh, actually providing its this protection and the mechanism is being uh, stimulated or provided or yeah before you started this were th are there any studies that uh where people looked at bleached coral areas versus that that rebounded from bleaching versus areas that bleaching resulted in 
coral death. Is there is there is there any microbiology? There analysis? are some studies uh, comparing. Uh, you mean corals that are more resistant or right? So the resilience, because uh, there there are yeah, all these stories several... that come out. They say, oh, this area it was bleached, but look, it returned and it came yes, back. Yes, there are several works showing that, and also works showing corals that are resistant. Uh, they don't bleach while all the other corals are bleaching the same coral species. Right. All other corals are bleaching and people are comparing it. But at this point, we don't know exactly what is the cause and the consequence if the microbiome changed because corals are suffering. And that's why also we start working with these manipulations because then we, we have the whole story. We have the corals, health, the healthy corals, then we start increasing the temperature and then you have uh, the corals, the microbiome being manipulated in different conditions. Like we have this microbe here and we don't have it here and how the coral respond to that and how the microbiome respond to that. And then you can have more information about cause and consequence because at this point, it's discrete things. Right. So, yeah. so there's a, a again half the world's oxygen, quarter <laughs> the fish. Okay, <laughs> so this is really important. Um, part of what you're doing is in uh, working on ways to create coral reefs uh, from scratch, and part yeah. of it is so that you can experiment. On them. But the other thing about that is, are we possibly going to get to a point where? we're going to need to create coral reefs in places that they weren't before because of the temperature changes that have happened. And this is going to be trying to keep up with the changing environment, less yeah. so about preservation on some level. You got it. I mean, yeah. This is oh, probably the question good. that, I mean, we've been doing the same question to us. I mean, are corals going to, to, to actually move to other areas that we don't have uh, colonized before? I mean, we don't know the answers. We know that some corals are actually some, we also have some people suggesting that we can bring species from one area to another area that is dying because it's gone. Yeah. And then we can have like uh, corals from the Indo Pacific and Florida and Caribbean to, because because people who who uh, arborists and the like or people in in charge of forests are already doing this and suggesting this. Yeah. Whereas if if a forest is burned, they don't replant with the trees that were there. They replant with the trees that will be more accustomed to that environment twenty years, thirty years, forty years from now. Yeah. And so there is this sort of uh, this forward looking, mm -hmm. accepting a fate of global warming. Yeah, uh, that's that's taking place in national parks, and I was wondering, yeah, is, is so the same people Please. are suggesting the same sort of thing. People are suggesting the same thing, but the thing is that diversity is very important too. Uh, to I mean, to keep the, the ecosystem functioning and, and all of the services that it provides. So there are people suggesting, as I, I mentioned, there are some corals that are resistant. Some people call them super corals, but they are super against uh, temperature. Uh, they are not the majority, they don't dominate the reef, so they are very likely sensitive to other things. So mm. they, they haven't been selected as the dominant corals. Uh, but they probably are going to be selected now. And some people were actually breeding these corals and trying to go for a strategy, as you just suggested, like to, 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 for restoration of reefs using only uh, these corals that are resistant. But I think that most of the people, even the people that are doing that, are trying to use hybrids and keep the diversity because we know that diversity is very important as source of genes and, and, and ecosystem uh, balance and also uh, resilience and services that can be provided. So this is on cards, but I think that it's being balanced with the need for uh, diversity to be kept. So uh, there are some efforts. There is a very uh, good group in Australia led by Madeleine Van Open, uh, working with uh, breeding of corals that are resistant. She's also working with probiotics, trying to make them even more resistant. And Ruth Gates that used to work with this too was the, one of the pioneers suggesting that we should go for it. And we should definitely go for it too, because I mean, less diversity is better than no diversity diversity at all yeah. i agree uh, yeah. and I, but I think if you can if you can balance if you can also try to keep and and work to 
to protect the diversity of colors that are not so resistant. I think it's mm -hmm. also important. To try and I, to I know my analogy it, used trees, which are plants. Yeah. And I admit fully, totally, complete transparency, thinking that corals were plants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We were talking about this before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Sorry, and, just and, I didn't realize I was secretly <laughs> making fun of you earlier. You were totally <laughs> making fun of me by being like, some people Sorry. don't even know that corals are animals. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing yeah. animals and very active animals. Well, at least you didn't get angry like visitors used oh. to to me. No, I, I, I absolutely. <laughs> they are plants. <laughs> I love being wrong. It's so much the, more the interesting thing about them being animals, they do, they're, they stay in one place for the most part. Part of yeah. their life cycle is like a plant. Yeah, it's stationary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catching food as it comes by, right? And then yeah. there's the reproductive part of the life cycle where they're shooting out their little go mad, go whatever they are, go mad of four gametes. Out, you know, they're, 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 they're genome packets, they're, as it they're were. Genome packets out into the <laughs> ocean, and those yeah. travel over distances. And so it's it is very it's interesting when you think of. Uh, you're looking from an ecosystem perspective and yes. Justin's idea of, you know, talking about trees made me think immediately of a uh, succession of forests where mm -hmm. there are certain plants that start the ecosystem yeah. and make it ready for the yeah. next mm -hmm. level of plants. And there is, this is something we know very well, and I'm sure it happens in the ocean as well. And it probably is also a huge part of corals ecosystems and their microbiomes that go along with it. Absolutely. Because the, the precursor to what you're talking about with the starting plants is having the mi right microbes in the soil for those plants to flourish. So it does always come back down to the microbiome uh, yeah. to support the, the structures above. Yeah. And sasso organisms in the ocean, they also have the, the microorganisms fluctuating in the water and they have to develop ways to attract them, to keep them, to use them and to, to I mean, they are just stuck there. They have to be mm. very efficient mm. to survive. And one interesting thing is also that we were talking about uh, refugees and, and the way things will go. And we've been thinking a lot about deep sea corals because mm. deep sea corals are very important also to, as, especially as um, store for the CO2 storage. And we also started now working with deep sea corals too, trying to understand a little bit more about how increased temperature can affect them. Uh, and also the interactions, the beneficial interactions that we can find in deep sea corals. Can we manipulate deep sea corals microbiome? Can we have probiotics to protect deep sea corals at least? So uh, we've been trying to be very broad about these and compare also things that we have uh, developed for shallow corals. And deep sea corals are very different. They, I mean, there is no light there. They are, especially in this depth that we're using around six, 700 meters, there's no light. So there's no, the, the symbiosis of the ocean this just don't exist. Do they have chemosynthetic bacteria doing the same job? Can we manipulate it? So trying to think of refugees and, and places where we can find, still find corals in the future. And, and for those not familiar <laughs> with uh, meters, 600 to 700 meters, is approximately 0.6 to 0.7 kilometers. So Very good. if you're more familiar with kilometers. That's yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was just looking because I was remembering that we did a story recently on the show about trying to find the ideal founding locations for new coral reefs mm -hmm. and uh, back in December. And it was all about sound. So there's what? these whole other, yeah, these what? other things. This is from Woods Hole. Yes, yeah, so this is back in December, on December 12th. Um, that the corals actually listen to the soundscape, potentially, it's a study, right? Okay. It's a preliminary study. But um, that, there, that acoustics actually have something to do with the suitability of a settling location for coral. So there's definitely, there's a lot going on with corals. We can corals. put the music and attract them to some yeah. areas. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put you have to put the 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 sexy coral music. Exactly. Maybe samba. Like it's them. kind of it's a right. week we can talk samba. about samba. Yeah, they like tropical waters. Right? <laughs> yes, they 
was like, yeah. like a little yeah. a little carnival uh, dance get it yeah, going yeah <laughs> there is a very interesting coral in brazil it's endemic species and it's uh, very common in bahia bahia is a state in brazil that is very famous uh, for its carnival and how important carnival is and this coral species only spawn during carnival and carnival <laughs> is not <laughs> even in the same month. It depends on the moon and it depends on several things, the spawning wow. thing. And it always happening happening uh, during carnival. Oh my so God. they are listening. See? Yeah. Like yeah. Santa. Yeah. I, so, yeah. I was I was looking. This one is about mostly about snapping shrimp. They think it's about snapping shrimp and just the sounds of life, which makes sense, which is part of this other question, right? Is how do you uh reestablish or establish a new reef if you don't have other biodiversity elements right mm -hmm. so so even if we fix their microbiome and we reduce some of these other stressors if other species have already left how do we kind of coax them back to make the coral reef work nice yeah so then it becomes this whole stream of like actually the coral reef pays no attention to the samba music coming from the shore <laughs> but the shrimp shrimp start dancing <laughs> and then the dancing shrimp gets the gets the, this fish excited which Cast starts swimming out. around the corals more yeah. which like yeah it's bring like, the larvae bring the larvae help the larvae to move yeah. you have to have a, a a full comprehension of this and and it, and it seems uh, a very difficult laboratory uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> what a lot of factors can, to control, especially right yeah. around carnival. Yeah, yeah. yeah, carnival sounds like a good strategy. <laughs> but but again, though, no, that is that is. By the way, that coral reef specific to that uh, off the coast of that carnival, that is exactly. If I were to choose a thing to study, that would be it. That would be it. Not, yeah. not some yeah. sort of Arctic archaeology where I'm digging in snow looking for. <gasps> <laughs> not something, not some hot desert thing where I'm going to like track cacti. No, it would be I distracting. I, I wouldn't go be able to go to Bahia. during the carnival. Yeah, but study. my students don't like it though because they have to go there and wait because they only spawn at night. And so they have to be there uh. looking at the curls, waiting with this red light in the head, it's waiting for them to spawn while everybody else is out there dancing <laughs> and having that's, fun. That's so, so it's cruel. Not that fun. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So that's okay. <laughs> the yeah, valley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to know how to keep keep track of uh, the work that you're doing, organizations that you're involved with that we can uh, follow along with and, uh, and and find out, you know, about advances in this field. Where can we find more sure, information? Sure, I think everything that we're doing is probably available on the, uh, the BMMO Network uh, website and on Twitter. I'm always posting things out at the BMMO Twitter and my, my own account. Uh, there are also some uh, things that uh, UC Davis is always uh, sharing at the UC Davis microbiome uh, program. So I think those places are probably the places that you find all the, the latest and things that we've been doing. Uh, the, the website of the Biosphere 2 Ocean is also being updated and more information about the new exciting things uh, coming out will be available there. The, the aquarium, the Rio uh, de Janeiro Marine Aquarium is also sharing, but most of the things are in Portuguese. So it's a good reason to learn to Portuguese. Learn Portuguese exactly. Everybody. I think everybody <laughs> should learn Portuguese. Yeah. <laughs> And and now we all know, uh, and, and we're going to let the listeners know, if you want to know how to say coral in Portuguese, Dr. Peixoto. Coral. Coral. It's the same word. <laughs> we can all say coral. And coral. we can say, no, I know some words in Portuguese. I know yeah. coral. Coral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It has Thank been wonderful you. to speak with you about the work that you're doing. This is, uh, as Justin said, very important work. Thank we're not going to put any. We're not going to put any more pressure on you here. Fate oh, of thank the you. Planet, the fate good. of the planet depends on your success <laughs> in, of your research. Like uh, up, yeah. like nothing else that's being done matters yeah. compared only, to what you're working on. Uh, okay, no, but seriously, the only thing that can save corals is the reduction of CO2 emissions. We can buy them sometime, we can make some things to help them, because even if it stopped right now, we're gonna have these accumulated gases that will 
still uh, provoke it. I mean, generate these uh, bleaching events. But the only thing that you can do is to reduce it. It's to continue. Unle unless you figure out a way to get them to sequester more carbon. Yes. The, yes. The, it's the fate <laughs> of the planet, Raquel. It's in your hand. Oh my God. Please save us. Yes. Please save us all. <laughs> Uh, we need to save ourselves. Thank you so much for joining Thank you us guys. tonight. It was awesome. Thank you. It was wonderful. Have a yes. wonderful evening. You too. All right, everyone. Links to these places will be on our website in our show notes, twist.org. We will be taking a quick break right now. We'll be back in just a few moments with more This Week in Science. Science is coming up. Stay tuned. <laughs> all right everyone i want to say thank you for joining us if you are in the portland oregon area April 3rd, This Week in Science, will be broadcasting live from the Alberta Rose Theater. You can find information at our website, twist.org. Additionally, if you would like to head over to twist.org, I'm going to do that right, right now myself. If you want to head over to twist.org, you can find all sorts of great things at our website. That is the place where you can find all twist goodness. So if you are interested in supporting Twist and our podcasting endeavors, you know, we are listener supported at this point. Your help, your support is what keeps us going. You can do that by visiting our Zazzle store. The Zazzle store is where you can find t-shirts, mugs, bags, cool things with the Twist logo, art from our Blair's Animal Corner calendar. Oh, there's a fun kiwi bag, a kiwi tote. That's new in there. We also have a crab phone cover, a Nautilus notepad, a mouse pad. That's what that is. Anyway, check out the Zazzle store. Many products, a portion of the proceeds do go to support This Week in Science. You can also click on our Patreon link. That will take you to our Patreon community where you can become a patron. Become a patron and donate once a month at the level that you are comfortable. If you donate $10 a month, that's about $2 per episode, you'll get thanked on the air by name. We will say thank you to you. And you also get some other fun things. Above $5, above $10, you still get thanked on the air. And you get other things. There's lots of cool things. But this is our community. It's a way that you can support us in an ongoing fashion. Back, back at twist.org, you can also donate on the yellow donate button that uh, works through a PayPal interface. Final way that you can help out Twist is by subscribing. That's right. You subscribe or get a friend to subscribe. You can click on the subscribe button on our website. website that'll take you to YouTube, iTunes, or the Google podcast portal, and you can choose your place for subscribing. It's pretty easy. You can send a friend there. It's great. We also have a newsletter, so if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do that. Join in the community. We all, we all can learn from each other, and really, all that we do here is for you and because of you. Thank you for your support. We really could not do this without you. You can't explain the things you've heard more than intuition. Well, I breeze and chose the way to go. New conclusion. The methods are hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. You sound so questioning, Blair. <laughs> are we back? Are we really back? I was just, I wasn't <laughs> sure. But it sounds like we're back.
Oh, we are back, everyone. And it is time right now for our favorite segment of the show this week in What Has Science Done For Me Lately? Lately? <laughs> what has it done? All right. This letter comes from listener Todd Bisk. He says, I just started, li I just listened to you read the letter from the person who has started a business getting brains from people who have donated their body to science to researchers. My dad recently passed away due to complications from cancer. He never went to college and spent his career as an electrician, but he never stopped learning. In his retirement, he was always reading science magazines, listening to talks from Neil deGrasse Tyson and read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. He had a closet full of science t-shirts and loved talking science so much that in a doctor's office one day, a person he was chatting with asked if he was a retired physics professor because of knowledge that my blue-collar dad had learned. Oh. The connection back to your previous letter is that my dad did donate his body to science, and it brought us so much peace when she received notice from the local university that they had accepted his body into their program. Thank you, science, for giving my dad a passion in his retirement and for giving us peace when when one of his final wishes was fulfilled. TB. Todd, thank you for sharing this. It is, you know, it's one thing to hear from the side of somebody who is, you know, involved in the, the distribution side of, uh, of people's donations of their, of their bodies, their lives to science, but to hear from a family member who has also benefited peace of mind in this way. It is, it's really touching and wonderful. So I appreciate your letter and your and that you shared with us. Thank you. It's, I love it. It makes me think about just how somebody takes that last step to make sure that they can help the future generations in whatever way as they exit, which is so cool. I love it. Yeah. Amazing. It is amazing. Thank you. And everyone, we need you to write in with letters, your haiku, your sonnets. Yeah. Let us know what science has done for you lately. What does it do for you every day? Send us an email. Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com is my email. You can also leave us a message on our Facebook page. Keep us filling this segment of the show with your stories. Can, can almost, I make a special request? It almost died once and everybody's brought it back. And I'm I'm so happy with all these letters we're getting. So thank you. I, I want to make a special request just because each of my requests has come true so far. So I'm going, I'm going three for three. Okay. I would like a musical. What has <laughs> science done for me lately? I would like someone to send us an MP3 or something. For a second, I thought you meant like a, a musical, like with scenes oh, and acts like a, like and a three act musical no like a, yeah a musical in three acts what Just, has science done for me lately i would say a tight 90 <laughs> seconds or less uh with musical accompaniment is what i mean a jingle wow somebody, I don't know. somebody get in touch with that dude from hamilton that yeah. you know <laughs> yes lin manuel miranda yeah yeah lin manuel miranda yeah. i'm sure he'll he'll get yeah. right on it <laughs> that is what i would like yeah <laughs> all right mp3 you want something musical what has science done for you lately all yeah. right okay that's going to probably take someone a little bit more work it, it probably will challenge. yeah what a challenge all right let's talk some science right. have you all heard about the uh the supposed second hiv patient who has been cured Mm, huh? I I did read a little headline about that earlier. I figured I'd learn about it tonight. So I fell and, off. And, and you will, because <laughs> yes. of course. Twist <laughs> of course does it again. again. That's right. Um, so the this is not the kind of treatment that everybody with uh with HIV is going to get. Uh, the reason that this individual and the first individual who had this particular treatment, uh, that they got the treatment that they did, is that they uh, developed Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so they developed a cancer that doctors decided could only be treated by a, a, a basically a 
a stem cell transplant and wiping out using chemotherapy to or radiation to wipe out the white blood cells, the stem cells in the body, wipe out the immune system effectively, and to put a new immune system in. So they, the first patient, they did this and found a donor that happened to have a mutation, one specific mutation that is resistant to HIV. And they found that it worked. It enabled the body. It it re it it re refreshed the immune system, and the HIV has not been seen since in that first patient. So in this second patient, it's a similar thing. They used a not complete radiation treatment, but a lighter chemotherapy, more specific chemotherapy treatment. So not the entire immune system was killed, uh, but it was a much more specific interaction with the immune system. And they found, an, again, a, an individual with a mutation that's resistant to HIV. They were able to give stem cells to this person that were not from, not from a, a complete match. These aren't stem cells that were taken from the HIV patient and then edited, like we've talked about gene editing, and this is something that, you know, gene editing could potentially be used for this possibly. But what they found is this is this is a stem, a donor, another individual who matched closely enough and had this particular HIV resistant mutation. They found that in the HIV positive patient, that the immune system, that there was rejection initially. And this happened in the first case as well. But that rejection uh, faded away within a short period of time. And a year and a half later, the patient appears to be completely HIV free. Wow. So, so many questions. Uh, <laughs> first one, how, how prevalent do we think this natural uh, HIV resistance is? In the human population, there is there is a, a small but significant number. Uh, a small, it's a small but significant percentage of of people who have this mutation. And, and so, so, how could this be extrapolated to a larger use? Because you said this couldn't be done exactly this way over and over and over. Well, the this is you know right now we have two people that it's worked in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was a third that they attempted it in, and it did not work. That the mm -hmm. there are a a couple of mutations that confer a little that confer resistance. One of them works slightly differently than the other, and so the third mm -hmm. patient that has also been reported that it didn't work in had that slightly different mutation where it wasn't quite enough to be able to outwit the H, uh, HIV. But it otherwise didn't hurt them, it sounds like, any of this process. No. Okay, so so in but, order to well, get this to a clinical trial, what would need to happen? Yeah, so resources. the resources, yeah, resources. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but you'd, you'd have to grow stem cells from these donors, right? Is that, you'd have to culture stem cells. Right. So you you would want to have some kind of a stem cell culture. Um, you know, the other the other possibility, though, is we've we've reported also on uh, this similar technique being used in multiple sclerosis patients to treat multiple sclerosis. There are um, also there's a, another kind of cancer, lymphoma, uh, that is being treated by uh, gene editing, where they are doing a similar treatment, but taking the patient's own immune cells, stem cells, these hematopoietic stem cells, and reprogramming them, and then putting them back in. And so there are a number yeah, of CAR -T. different, CAR, yes, uh, yes. CAR, CAR -T. T. Yeah. So there are a number of different approaches using this same technique. The one problem, however, is that this is like the last ditch effort where no other treatments are working because mm -hmm. you're you're either using radiation or chemotherapy to kill your immune system. Mm -hmm. And then this is incredibly invasive, you know, taking somebody else's 
cells and putting them in your body. And there is the chance of rejection and death. Mm -hmm. And so this is not something that is taken lightly by anyone or, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to do that. You know, right. this is, this is, I don't have any other choice mm -hmm. at this yeah, point. So, so that's the thing with the uh, CAR T therapy, which actually uses, it somehow uses a hollowed out HIV. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. to, and is, and uses and incorporates the individual's white blood cells in there to then go get reintroduced. Um, it cures blood cancer in like 48 hours. Yeah. which which sounds like everybody with blood cancer needs this but there is a percentage where it doesn't work and there's a catastrophic fail yeah and and thus they own this is the reason why you have to be at that everything mm -hmm. else every other arrow from the quiver has been launched and missed the target before they will uh allow this uh, and it costs a million dollars but um, <laughs> But we are we are talking about the first indications that we have even had yeah. uh, that there is a and again we this is the horrible caveats that always come with cancer or HIV cures, which is that it's a pathway to a door to a thing. Right. However, yeah. However, actually, this is like one of the first examples of no, there's a thing that will work. There is a there is an end result. There's that a thing is, that can that you work. can call yeah. cure. Yeah. And is is this is the final doorway. Uh we just need to figure out, make sure that we know all of the other doors leading up to this one. Right. It yeah, it can work. It way. has worked. It may mm -hmm. work. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, when it, well yeah. it may work, it may not work for everyone. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. But yeah. but it does work. Thus, therefore, like. How is this now like automatically? Like, is there a percentage of the national budget that goes just specifically yeah. to following up on this? Well, what I'm wondering is further down the line, is is this something where you know you get your your you give blood, you figure out what your blood type is, they put out calls for specific blood types that they need in certain situations. You get on a bone marrow registry, you might get called up if somebody needs your bone marrow. Do we all need to figure out who is carrying this HIV resistance so we can yeah. call them up? <laughs> like, right. And is there, is there a, right, is there a specific uh, genetic test that you could take yeah. to be a uh, a donor for either this HIV treatment or mm -hmm. one of those multiple sclerosis or, or CAR T treatments, you know, is or, there, or, is there something? Or do you need not but one individual right. That's and a question. incubation factory yeah. uh, somewhere Absolutely. that says, we're going to take this one individual. I see a little bit of, 90, of Jared's or, over there. At this, yeah. part, at this <laughs> but, point, uh, yeah. I guess two thirds of, 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 of trials and and just do a cloning replicating conservation keep this person alive as long as they can so we can keep getting fresh samples and uh but just knowing what the mutation is i yeah. mean similar it, it it if we know exactly what the mutation is then is there the possibility that we can change the treatment so it's not incorporating foreign cells but actually is uh, a, an editing of the patient's own cells. Right. And that's, that is, I think, would oh, be yeah. the, the, the better way to go. But who, you know, who knows how soon we'll be able to get there. One of the interesting things related to this story, though, is that in both of these successful case, cases, and right now it's like, okay, one point is one point, right? Now we have two points. Oh, look, we've got a line. A line. Is, is this a trend? We can't say that yet, but we have we have some inklings of maybe what will come next. And both of these successful cases, the immune system had a, a short-lived rejection where the, the new immune cells that have been pumped into the body were attacking the host's immune cells. And there's a question as to whether this as it is an important part of the success of, uh, of, of this procedure working. Whether that immune response of these new cells 
attacking what is left of the old immune system is part of, of what kills off that dormant HIV. That's just... Yeah. Really interesting question. We don't know yet, but this is the same, this, this, this story of, you know, we try things and can learn from it along the way. And uh, luckily it has worked for a couple of people so far and it's giving us some really interesting information. Um, yeah, They'd have a couple a... good what has science done for me lately. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Where's that one? <laughs> that one should have been in the mix by now. Yeah. That's quite a big one. That's yeah. a huge one. Um, moving forward, some other interesting news. There are a couple of stories out this week, and I, th I thought it was really interesting that two stories on limb regeneration, the ability hmm. to regrow parts of your body. Uh, two stories on this area of research came out this week. One story from the Proceedings of the Royal Society B looked at 35 species of marine ribbon worms. You say, why Yay. are they looking at marine ribbon worms? <laughs> why are they looking at these? Well, one of these marine ribbon worms, a particular species, has the ability to, I think it's the ribbon worm Linnaeus sanguineus. Is that a blood drinker? <laughs> no, yeah, probably. probably. Sang sanguineus. sanguineus. Yeah, yeah. Most, yeah. This ribbon worm has the ability to regrow its whole body and head from just one two hundred thousandth of an individual <laughs> and so in this in this uh this this, this, this this press release article the it's written that that's like regrowing a 150 pound person from just 0 0.012 ounces of tissue or about one sixteenth of a teaspoon. That's like less than a fingertip. Yeah, it's like, okay, take a little bit of my fingertip and then regrow even more of me. <laughs> I can so, help myself. I can help myself. I have to say something. Can yeah. I do this for yes. Carlos? <laughs> can, we, <laughs> can we learn how to do that? Because we can use that for Carlos to regrow Carlos. Oh. Absolutely. If the corals <laughs> could learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no apologies necessary. That's great. So, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't help the, myself. The part that is mind boggling is literally the part where it regrew ahead because that's the part where I figure, like, that's where I am. <laughs> like, the re like, everything else is your Well, arm, these guys don't really leg, have a, a brain liver, as you think about it. Things. It's a little but, different. Okay. Yeah. They kind of have a glob of, of nerve tissue, but they don't have a a full brain like you think about but what it. happens if yeah one you gets tell in a that to the accident? worms player what, what if a worm gets in a bad accident with a blender <laughs> now there's a whole community of that same worm that's the question <laughs> isn't it yeah yeah so the interesting thing is we have this one worm and and researchers thought that phylogenetically this was like a a, a, a basal trait that these worms these group this group of ribbon worms that all the other worms who couldn't regenerate that they had seen, they probably just lost the trait. And so they did this analysis, looking at these ribbon worms, they found them all over the place, and did a bunch of regeneration experiments to see who could regenerate and who couldn't, and also looked at their evolutionary relationships. And what they determined is that the original trait was not to be able to regenerate and that these worms, there are certain species of them that it, through convergent evolution, they wow. Wow. gained the ability to regenerate. This crazy regenerating ling lineus sanguineus had gained it in a similar way that other species did. So the question is, why did they gain the ability to regenerate when previous, the ancestral species was unable to? And, and so they and don't so, think it was an ancestral trait. Right. So this is, and the reason I think that we were talking about it as possibly of having been an ancestral trait is because we think of like fish being able to regenerate an eye. We look at, we look at species that, that uh, going forward, these, these regenerative traits get lost over time, but to know that we could converge towards it. 
Yeah. Ooh. So this next study out of Woods Hole, scientists at the Marine Biological Laboratory have been looking at the axolotl, a salamander mm. that is oh, capable the of thing that's limb. ever lived. They can regrow their limbs. You cut off a leg, they'll regrow, and they're just the most and they're horrible, ridiculously frilly, cute. yeah, yes. frilly, gilly things. Mm. Um, but this paper is published in Nature Communications Biology, and they compared the genes involved in regeneration in the axolotls to the genes that are involved in regrowth of skin and other tissue. You know, we have very slight regenerative abilities. We can regrow our skin. Oh, constantly, um, right? But we yeah. end up with scar tissue more often than we end up with a new thumb, right? Well, so, they <laughs> <laughs> so they wanted to find out why, what the difference is and they're looking at these different uh, genes and they found that it actually goes back to micro RNA and that by modifying gene expression they were able to uh, they were able to control the micro RNA and the regenerative ability of the axolotls so they found in the human injury response a gene called CFOS gets paired with a gene called C. June. In axolotls, they found that CFOS is activated by June B, a different protein. There's a different protein pairing. And it's these microRNAs that regulate which proteins get turned on to be paired when. And it's the axolotls and the humans, all, we all have the same proteins. We have June B. Uh -huh. And the axolotls have C. June. And they found that if they played around and modified the gene expression, they could control the microRNAs and they caused in the axolotls C. Fos to be paired with C. June and, san and the salamanders to be unable to, uh, to regain a functioning spinal cord after. Injury. So, so, but then maybe the reverse is also trying to make it up. Maybe right. The right. And so, and get me some nice stat. <laughs> right. And so this, it, what we're looking at here is like in the worms, you know, the, those ribbon worms and in us and in other species, we have all of these genes that are present for our developmental process and our repair processes. Mm -hmm. However, I certain see. pairings get turned on at different times. And so it's this, you know, uh, this, this musical, uh, you know, this wonderful musical sheet music of what, when the violins get turned on versus the oboes, right? Mm -hmm. And so it maybe this is what's happening in evolution, that the, the control of those micro RNA is this this fine tuned control that leans, leads to being able to regenerate yourself from one sixteenth of a teaspoon of your bodily tissue? <laughs> it would and, make and sense to me that there is an intermediate in between the axolotl and us in terms of regeneration, because there are regenerative abilities in other groups in between us. So in between. Amphibians like the axolotl and us, there's reptiles that can regrow their tails. They're not exactly the mm -hmm. same, but there is regeneration happening there. Yeah. And in mammals, there's spiny mice that can regrow uh, skin sections and hair sections extremely well. And we've talked a bunch on the show about how uh, bears in hibernation can grow oh. back skin and hair yeah. to the point where th they have no scar tissue. I'd be uh, very bears interested don't, to see. Bears don't hibernate. <laughs> Good one, Justin. You're, you you're absolutely accurate about that. Yes, they they <laughs> undergo winter sleep, using colloquialism here. Anyway, um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see if to follow this narrative through, to see if these same pathways, these same um, tools are being used across genera, because I think that would make it that much easier to do some tweaking in a mammal. <laughs> right. And, you know, you we, we still don't know. I mean, this is this is one gene pairing? Are there other genes that get yeah. turned on? Are there other things responsible for different aspects of regeneration? You know, okay, spinal cord, this is what's getting turned on for a nerve to regrow. But what about connective tissue? What about uh, blood vessels? What about the other stuff that is in there as well? There are very likely different 
cellular instructions for the regeneration of different things. Yeah. And so it's a it's going to this is just the beginning of starting to dig into this in in a very different way. But the researchers think this is uh, potentially going to be huge, not just for spinal cord injury, but also for neurodegenerative diseases. So diseases Ooh. in which nerves have pruned themselves too much, died back, lost their connections. How can you get them to start reaching out and connecting more again? And right, these, but, uh, these it, micro RNAs and this gene expression might be a big part of it. Yeah, and as as Raquel was pointing out, though, uh, yeah, I mean, and maybe I'm over uh, guesstimating that the the coral genome is a bit simpler than the human genome, because uh, uh, every time I think that, like, oh, this genome versus that genome, they should be, and I'm like almost always wrong. But if if <laughs> if if there, if, can you imagine if there's an application here? uh for of applying a genome from something as as i would claim to be advanced even though all genomes are just as advanced over time just everything's just as evolved it's just it didn't change as much uh caveat, um, caveat, to, caveat. To, yeah to apply this to something like uh to corals would be game changing for the importance of a quarter of the fish and half the oxygen on the planet People are trying to, to manipulate the genome of, of corals. There is a very recent paper from Stanford, from Stephen Palumbi's group, okay. uh, showing that they can use CRISPR to with Abstasia and trying to use it for corals to get those resistant corals and make them more resistant. So it's not exactly, I mean, but it's more or less, I mean, people have thought about it also trying to Maybe, I mean, we are finding, we've, we've talked on this show about the interactions between our microbiota and our nervous system and the, how there's a stimulatory, there's a communicating effect between the, the you know, either the metabolites of them. Between them. those two. And then we learned also that yeah. the, the, the nervous system is actually responsible for sending out regulation of, of organ repair. So, yeah. you, so very quickly, these connections start to be Thanks. very important. And yeah. if we're talking about gene expression, you know, how is, is there a microbiota, like can, can we affect gene expression that increases microRNAs that lead to growth? And is that the pathway? There is, is a student, happening? there is a new student coming to my lab from San Diego, Adam Barno. His idea is to try to understand that if it's possible oh, wow. to regulate it uh, and use some kind of approaches to understand if this happened actually when we use our BMCs, if some kind of regulation of genes can also um, turn up to be the on, one of the reasons that we are managing. One of the mechanisms behind yeah, the, the, mechanism. the effect that we see. Yeah, it's his topic uh, for this thesis. It's also something that can happen. So both things, the, the manipulation of genomes and the regulation of genes are also things that people were trying to actually reach out and see whether we can. I mean, we have to use yeah. all the, the, the weapons and Everything. all the ideas yes. <laughs> and yeah. combine them all. <laughs> all the things. Yeah. All right. Justin, do you have a story? I might. Uh, let me take a look. Oh, yeah. This was uh, this one caught my eye. This was uh, Columbia University researchers. They found evidence that sound waves carry mass. Which is just crazy, but also feels like I've experienced this at a club at some point. Uh, their paper published. <laughs> you go stand in front of the bass speaker. Yeah, you can feel in front it. of those speakers. That's just you, you really getting feel... tinnitus, is what you're here, what you're feeling. <laughs> it's just all the hairs in your ear going, no. This is uh, published in the journal Physical Review Letters. Angelo Esposito, uh, Rafael uh, Kirk. Kierczewski and Alberto Nicolis uh, describe using effective field theory techniques to confirm results found by a team last year attempting to measure mass carried by sound waves. So uh, they, uh, they used quantum field theory to show that sound waves moving through a superfluid helium carried a small amount of mass. It's very small. So this was in one second uh, 
uh, of water actually in a in another state using effective field theory they showed that a single watt sound wave that moved for one second in water would carry with it a mass of approximately 0.1 milligrams it seems really small but that's not very long and that's just a little bit uh they further noted that the mass was found to be a fraction of the total mass of a system that moved with the wave as it was mm -hmm. displaced from one site to another uh quote voice no this isn't quote voice this is just a statement in this synopsis mm -hmm. importantly researchers did not actually measure mass being carried by a sound wave they just move used math to prove that it was happening for a real world measurement, they suggest experiments could be conducted with sound waves as they move through a Bose Einstein condensate made of very cold atoms. Such a setup should show enough mass being carried to allow for a measurement. They also note a better approach might be to measure the mass being carried by sound waves moving through the earth as part of an earthquake. Now that much sound could carry billions of kilograms of mass which might be visible on devices that measure gravitational waves so wouldn't it be funny to, like this is the, the, the current what occurred to me during this study is lego which has been looking for gravity waves for forever but is always getting like a ah, truck went by and it set off the detector and <laughs> and and there was, loud concert at the stadium and it set off the detect what if all this time they were also detecting gravity waves from sound and just didn't know it just kept ruling it <laughs> ruling it out so, so how the, sorry you go kiki <laughs> yeah the thing that's interesting here is this differentiation between the the wave in air that we all if you've heard of sound and you see you've heard uh, of sound you've heard of sound <laughs> you might have heard uh, of it you've heard of sound before if you just read about sound you don't know what we're talking about but if you've heard so, about it you totally so understand. if if you've seen ripples on water or the um you know sand bouncing on the the head of a drum uh you may have seen the impact of sound where it yep. is a physical yes occurrence this is and a this force is, and this is so there are transfer. there are molecules yes. that are trans that are bumping into each other and transferring that sound and it's a wave and it yes. travels through the fluid that is air or water whatever um but it is not just that physical force there's this this idea that's been pushed along called the phonon phonon and it's, and it's not Love like like a photon, but it's a phonon. Like it's a phonograph. A phonograph. So it, it, it starts to allow the uh, description of sound as a particle yes. and not just the force that is transferred between the molecules bumping into each other hmm. because of sound. Yeah. And so it's a, I, it, it kind of twists my brain up in a kind of funny way. And so, Justin, is what this study saying? Is that the beyond the mass of the particles in the air that are affected by a sound wave, the phonon that tr is transferring mass? They're saying along that the that phonon interacted with a gravitational field in a way that forced them to carry mass along as they moved through a material. So they're mm -hmm. they're saying that the 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 yes, they're saying that the mass is being transferred separately from the displacement and separately mm -hmm. from uh, the energy that then dis displaces other particles uh, in, in their mass. But that mass itself is being transmitted via these phonons. Yeah. I don't even know what to think about that. This is, yeah. that's fascinating. <laughs> All right. So there is, there's, there's the phonon, right? Not the photon, the phonon. And like a photon has mass. So your does brains are getting heavier just by listening to this show. The, <laughs> yes. That's what that means. <laughs> that's, this show is full of heavy sounds. <laughs> so much mass. <laughs> 
All right, moving on. It is time right now for another part of the show. What part of the show was it? What comes next? Oh, I wonder. I, I do believe it is time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. There it is. She loves our creature, great and small. Five pets, mill a pet, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas. It's an what you got, Blair? Well, I'm starting off tonight with a story that was sent to me by you, Justin, ah, last week. Right before it was breaking news, right before the show, I couldn't get it in. I'm so excited to bring it to you now. This is a study um, from University of Cincinnati looking at spiders that look like ants. Now, let me ask you first, do you mm -hmm. think a bird prefers to eat spiders or ants? Ants. Uh, I would say spiders. <gasps> interesting. Very interesting. It Just turns I would, out. I would. Well, I guess they both bite, but I would think spider spiders might be more venomous. So. Spiders are tastier. They're just so. Just I mean, I know not everybody has has taken the the know. taste test, but spiders are way yummier than ants. Ants are oh, very formic acid, so, not so tasty. What usually like. Okay, Blair, answer the question. <laughs> University of Cincinnati doctoral student and lead author of this paper reported on here is she has a, a great way of describing this kind of this difference in opinion in birds. Quote: Most birds avoid ants and and their painful stingers, sharp mm -hmm. mandibles, and habit of showing up with a lot of friends. Try mm -hmm. to eat one, <laughs> and you're likely to get chewed on by ten more. That's why nearly every insect family from beetles to mantises has sp species that mimic ants. By comparison, spiders are delicious and nutritious. <laughs> so uh, she goes on to say, I absolutely loved this quote. That's what a lot of natural selection is about, to convince other species not to eat you and to convince members of your species to mate with you and to do so at the least cost possible. <laughs> I kind of want to put that, you know, in embroidery on my wall. I think it's a really good explanation of natural selection. Convince species not to eat you. Convince members of your own species to mate with you at the least cost possible. I love it. So these jumping spiders have adapted <laughs> to look like ants. They look like Smart ants. spiders. Very clever. Yes, but this study is looking specifically at how do they go from spiderling, little tiny spider, to adult, continuing to look like ants all the time, and still finding and attracting potential mates if they look like ants. This is a very good question, one that doesn't have a 100% answer yet, but we have started, University of Cincinnati has started to gather some ideas. They look like ants from the side um, as juveniles, but as adults, their profile looks more and more spider-like. From the top, they always look like ants. But it's not enough just to have the body shape of an ant. They also have to act like one. This is where this gets especially interesting spiders as we know have an extra pair of legs compared to ants they have no antenna so instead they take their four legs and they wave them around like antenna over their They're head mimicking being an ant it's not just a morphology they have to go through an and act behavior. of mimicry on top of the morph morphological resemblance it does not end there. It doesn't. There's more. No, there's more. When I ants against a steak knife. <laughs> <laughs> when ants follow a trail, you you might have seen they kind of wave their head back and forth. This is them trying to cast back and forth over a chemical trail to sense it. These jumping spiders also bob their head back and forth, which has no functional significance as far as we can tell. So go ahead, take your front legs, stick them in front of your face. Wiggle them around like antennas and then shake your head back and forth. Shake your head back and forth. You're doing <laughs> the ant mimicking jumping spider. There we go. Awesome. It's our, it's our new dance. Yes. I like it. Um, so 
On top of all of this, this is a kind of jumping spider that can't jump. Ants don't <laughs> jump. Poorly named. So these Poorly spiders named cannot spider. jump. We don't know if it's because of their shape, so they can't, they physically can't jump, or if they don't jump because it would give away. Because their ants disguise. don't jump. Yes, we yeah. don't know. So this is also. All at the same time, they actually switch tactics halfway through their life. They mimic two different species of ants during their lifetime. This is the part that drives me nuts. The, the adult spiders mimic a bigger ant, and young spiderlings mimic a tinier black ant. So their body mm. shape does change somewhat subtly as they age. So where does this all go here? This is all stuff that we've learned, especially this sh uh, this wagging the head back and forth thing is something that we have not observed before. We have mm. observed spiders sticking their, their legs out as antennas, but this full-on behavioral display is something we haven't really seen before. But what uh, caught the researchers' eyes here was trying to figure out exactly how one jumping spider can catch another one if they are so good at pretending to be ants. How can they meet each other and start little spider families if they're just blending in with the ant crowd? Especially in a group of animals, jumping spiders that are renowned for, you know, dancing and jumping and their courtship yes. rituals, as we know. So, they found something in, in just kind of their preliminary research. They found something um, that was these spiders' own sort of potential courtship rituals. They found a quote-unquote handshake behavior where they seem to acknowledge secret each other handshake. from a distance. Secret handshake. A no secret spider. handshake. <laughs> um, so awesome. Delth spider with the secret handshake. Yes. So as Alexa says, she is so great. I want to have her on the show now. It's as if one says, hi, I'm not an ant. And the other says, I am also not an ant. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, it's definitely there. It's distinct from just walking around. And it's not something I've seen an ant do before. But how do they know to do that? Is it just they're doing that because it's like it's mating season and so I'm going to do this periodically? Or do they have, we know that jumping spiders also sometimes do little drumming. Like they have uh, right. t like sound that they transmit. Um, is that part of it possible? So there are two potential hypotheses for that part of this question. The first hypothesis is that it is about their view from the side. So remember, mm. juvenile spiders still look like ants from the side, but adult spiders look more and more spider-like from the side. From the top, still totally ant-like, but from the side, as they age, they start to look more and more like spiders. So the idea is that it might be just enough of a hint that they can go, hey, you don't quite look like an ant. Are you a spider? Yep, I'm a spider. Nice to see you. <laughs> so it's. <laughs> but, but what if they get what if they get confused and like do the secret handshake with an ant? Is the ant, and is like, hey, I, I'm not I'm not an ant, and the ant's like, yeah, you are. Oh yeah, I'm totally an ant. Yeah, you're right. This is not a behavior that they have ever seen in ants before. So as far as we can tell, so ants is... do their chemical signals. This is totally separate. Yeah, the ants a, do a... ants do touch their feelers. Mm -hmm. So they communicate, they they touch their right you know, their their feelers. But to they're each not other, doing they're, they're not, not doing these waves from other. far away. Yeah, they're not yeah. these waves are from a, a slight distance. They're not in touching Yoo -hoo. distance. Hello. Yoo -hoo. Yoo -hoo. This is a very mind-blowing spider because I mean, <laughs> just by itself, I mean. The mimicry of another species we see repeated many, many times, but sort of the mimicry of two sort of separate, distinct forms of, uh, it's in the same family, but still two different ants as it grows and as it progresses through its morphology and, and adulthood and juvenile. That by itself is just incredibly fascinating. Yeah, that, I mean, it must that, be effective. It, it helps them to not get eaten, find mates at low cost. And there it's one of the, it's one of the, it's one of those, work. like, part of it is, like, natural selection. You just happen to look like the thing because everything else got eaten. But to go through stages of multiple mm -hmm. 
that's pretty that starts to get pretty intense it's a lot of evolutionary time uh, yeah. but it also reminded me this whole waving idea of something that occurs in other areas in the animal kingdom specifically bearded dragons <laughs> they will wave at each other from a distance but this is usually like hey i see you don't you come over here oh. <laughs> so it's kind of the opposite but it's more like hey i see you other lizard this is my space yeah. Um, and then yeah. awkwardly, the other lizard so. didn't notice. And so the lizard, uh, did he, the, the other lizard didn't see. I'm going to have to yeah. do this again. Oh, they're looking yeah. now. Ah, stay away. Ah, yeah, I yeah, exactly. Somewhere. So the other hypothesis that I think is worth mentioning is that they do, in fact, have a complex mating behavior like other jumping spiders, but they are able to do this in hiding. <laughs> so via this waving technique, they're able to sneak away from be birds together. or researchers yeah. and yeah. be spiders together. Absolutely. So there's this is just a preliminary study. We've done the University of Cincinnati did some fact finding here. We've learned some amazing things about what jumping spiders can do. And uh, I can't wait to, to find out more sometime. Yeah. Yeah, tell me more about your next story. Yes. So speaking of mating techniques of spiders, we are now going to move to mating techniques of dolphins, specifically uh, what, what their social life is like prior to their dating days. This is a piece of research from Southern Australia from Flinders University, looking at pods of dolphins, specifically bachelor groups of dolphins. And it turns out that bottlenose dolphins that make strong bonds with other male relatives in a social circle improve success with breeding when there is a limited number of females. So this study looked at 12 different social groups in South Australia. And each of these groups had two to five individuals that they, they formed, quote, beneficial alliances. And when these beneficial alliances formed, they had more sexual success. Well, you know, this just sort of, I mean, that sounds to me like you're comparing socialized dolphins to loner dolphins. Like the loner dolphin who doesn't, isn't used to interacting with anyone else is going to have a harder time interacting with a female than at least somebody who's had a lot of casual like social interaction that or or do, I mean does it does it, it I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't say that dolphin male dolphins that have a lot of female dolphin friends always get friend zoned <laughs> that would be all awesome. well in these in these test groups the females were in very low number so the idea is that the females were the the limiting variable so what what appears to have happened is that they tested sexual su success by looking at uh chances for mating which was higher if they hung out with other males growing up and that versus, they were but versus what that's the that's the question. Right. So versus versus smaller no social friends? groups, social groups with less relatives, um, less bachelors, more family, stuff like that. So uh, the other thing was that they were they were better at defending females and preventing other males from mating with their females. Wow. It's. It's is Used to partially the competition in the rough housing in the in the pack of boys. Yes, absolutely. That's so right. part of it is socialization, um, but it also they think it has to do with training. So just spending more time with the other bachelors that are related to you means there's more sparring that is not as harmful in the end. It's more kind of playful in nature, but that means you get stronger. That means you get better at defending your space. So. Of it could also be that the dolphin that was in the family environments that were, was like, nah, I've seen how families go. Oh, yeah, yeah, good luck. Have fun being married. Dolphin sucker. <laughs> sure. You have um, no idea. The response, but then you got a house payment, you got a mortgage, you got a car payment. I've seen it. I grew up around families. Ah, thanks. Uh, moving. The other, 
Yeah. Go Another ahead. question here that's being brought up in the chat room is, you know, is this similar to, you know, a gang of, is it a gang of males who uh, together like help each, like, you know. Mm. Good like, question. No, this was not <laughs> a teaming gang, up. Is this, this was not ganging up on females. This was no. not a lone sorority girl at the frat house. This is not what okay. that was. Oh, okay. Geez. This was. Uh, just normal dolphin dynamics and they just do better having they had just those social do better specifically okay. when there's less females around yeah so my last story to leave you on a little bit of of hope and an unexpected use of technology which i always think is very interesting in the animal science world this is from university of oxford university of birmingham and ben gurion university in the negev have found that how people use the internet is tied to patterns and rhythms in the natural world. They looked at Wikipedia page view records to look at people's online interest in plants and animals. It was a huge data set of 2.33 billion page views spanning three years. They looked at there were 30, over 31,000, almost 32,000 species searched through this data set across 245 Wikipedia languages, 245 languages. This is quite a data set. What they found was that there were seasonal trends in Wikipedia interest for plants and animals, and that those trends followed seasonality of species views in the wild. So people so, are seeing things and going, I want to yes. know more about that. So that's cool, first of all, because that just means people are seeing animals in the wild and then want to learn about them, which is exactly what makes the internet great. When, when people want to talk about how the internet has messed with society, this is exactly my counterpoint, is that some people use it to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine Actually that. Yeah. learning more about yeah. the world. And yeah. if I saw a funny duck on my walk through the park today, and then I would have to go to the library and check out a book and flip through a 300 page book of local waterfowl to find maybe the duck I was looking at. I don't know how many people would actually do that, but if you can pull out your phone and type into Wikipedia, San Francisco duck species, you'd probably find it pretty quick and you could learn all about it. So that's the one side of this that I think is so cool is people are actually using the internet in real time to learn about animals that they see and plants that they see in the wild. But the other thing is that not only did the seasonality match, the amount and the timing of internet activity was found to be an accurate measure of when and how the species was present. Yeah. So you could actually reverse engineer this data to figure out distribution and prevalence of species. So, so immediately I, I went to thinking about uh, Google did this uh, this sharing with uh, one of the medical associations or whatever. Maybe it was the CDC. Um, whereas people are putting in symptoms. Like I have a runny nose and a rash on my forehead or whatever the thing is. And then suddenly there's this nexus of this symptom being typed into Google in an area. And then, you know, you might have a potential outbreak and you might be able to drill down on what that outbreak is. And you get a couple mm -hmm. of medical reports and you say, okay, now we have this and this. Yeah, you could absolutely, I can see how you could absolutely use that data of search engine queries for a plant or an animal mm -hmm. and kind of get a, a grip on the health or the motion or the, the appearance of this plant in an area or the, the sightings of an animal in a region. Yeah. Migrations, yeah. Uh, the movements of animals around the world and the timing of those searches is going to show you that flux. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just as it visualized, I want yeah. to see, see this data in a visualization. I think that would be a oh, beautiful, beautiful. I'm sure beautiful. it's not far off. Yeah. Um, one thing that's really cool about this too, is that they were able to adjust some of their data for, uh, not just seasonal patterns, but, uh, cultural events. So for example, page views for Turkey in English were 
at an annual spike around Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh. um, and the television event Shark Week also caused a spike in shark queries. That's, so if yeah. you recognize these anticipated spikes based on cultural events, you can you can kind of pull out that noise really easily. So this data set is already so robust and it's I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg as it as it were. Um, but you can see how you could use all this data to potentially come up with something that is pretty helpful in wildlife conservation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, about 10 minutes left in the show, and I have one more story. Quickly, dinosaurs, they died, right? Aww. Except for birds. They, they died out, and, and it was this idea that, yes, the asteroid came and decimated the dinosaur populations, but they were already kind of suffering from climate change issues, and they just, they weren't as as adaptable as maybe species today, you know, but a study just published in Nature Communications uh, looked at a bunch of fossils from North America and based on their analysis, they have determined that, oh no, dinosaurs were thriving and they were cut down. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't dying the dinosaurs dying out finally taken out by a, a an asteroid strike no they were they were thriving and doing well and they were diverse and it's just the way you look at the fossil record and what we've been able to see from what was laid down as fossils and what we have found as fossils and the way it has been analyzed. And so this new way of looking at the data, these researchers from the University College London, they say um, that, these, that these dinosaurs, they were actually very widespread and uh, doing really well. And and by the way, so oh, were we mammals. Great. Yeah, and and the mammals were great too, but dinosaurs yeah. were doing really awesome, and yes. they would have lasted a lot longer if it weren't for the asteroid. So you never know when that asteroid is going <laughs> oh, to strike. No. live for today. Everybody, that so, is my that's my take home message. So the other part of that story is also due to climate change that came much later. It's very likely that the mammals would have exploded just as we did. Uh, and that, that the dinosaurs would have gotten gotten pinched into a narrow band towards the, the equatorial region, whereas m mammals would have been able to expand into territories dinosaur-free, predator-free. But we'll never know. Right. See, I, so that's what couldn't. I was going to say. I all the time will just sit and wonder what dinosaurs would look like today if they continued to evolve. Probably a uh, lot like that. Man. Oddly. I don't think so we would have our cities. I mean, there are a lot of predator dinosaurs that were like, oh, yummy little mammals. I don't know. We might have hunted them all. What, what's <laughs> actually very interesting is the well, dinosaur. We the That's another story. We, the, the, we, we hunted this giant. We did. We hunted off. and killed oh, off this yeah. last. But what's also surprised. interesting is the, the dinosaur with the biggest brain was bipedal and about six feet tall. Oh. So their covergent evolution. Like it's like that like, TV show dinosaurs. No, it's like it's probably like that could have been a thing if dinosaurs were allowed to evolve. Oh my god. Like a lot of the precursors and the and the sort of fleshy feet pumping yep. in, it's the brain, like yep. uh, the thing that might have led to human intelligence. Anyway, my last story is give it. Be careful walking your dog. Uh, <laughs> An asteroid fracture, might come. Fracture injuries linked to dog walking went up 163% from 2004 to 2017. 78% of the fractures that occurred while dog walking were amongst women. And uh, I think it was more than 50% were in seniors. So while you may be being encouraged if you're over the age of 65 to get out and exercise, do so without your dog because there's a compounding of it's and what's really sort of just insane about this story is that uh, one of my kids grandmothers broke her wrist 
walking a dog, which they say is 50% of the injuries. I'm sorry, 50% of the injuries in seniors. 78% of the seniors who walk dogs are women who, who get injured. That's and 50% of yeah. those injuries are upper arm fr uh, fractures, which because is exactly what and... happened yeah. to grandma. Yeah. Oof. Which they is get old, like or weird they that this study they fall, almost and, seems yeah. to be describing the fact that like it, it was unavoidable. Oof. Yeah. Ugh, be yeah. careful walking a dog. I mean, it's outdoors. It's the great outdoors. I mean, you could get a dog and hire a dog walker and stay at home and... But don't it do just that you're just one squirrel away from that hip or arm fracture. <laughs> or you just can, train your you, dog not to pull also. And you could also slip in the shower. So it this yeah. is there are injuries everywhere, but yeah, you know. Anyway, be careful. Yeah, just be careful walking your dog. That's all we're saying. Or just get a small dog. <laughs> <laughs> and and as as my mom used to say, be good. If you can't be good, be careful. If you can't be careful. <laughs> Oh, well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. All right. We have made it to the end of another episode of This Week in Science. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this show for bringing us into your life for today. I would love to say thank you to a few people who have helped to make this show possible. To Fada for helping with show notes and social media. To Identity4 for helping to record the show. To Gord McLeod and Ben Rothig, others in the chat room who maintain our chat room and keep it a nice place to hang out and talk about science. I would also like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaras, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Aiden Jeff, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stefan Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Corinne Benton, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Bignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Sarah Chavis, R.T. Omrick, Ramus Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim DePode, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Lessman, Kurt Larson, Ray, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflow, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and... EO. Thank you for your support on Patreon. And if everyone, anyone, if you would like to support us on Patreon, you can find a link at twist.org. Also, tell a friend about Twist this week. It was a really good interview, wasn't it? Tell them they should listen to that. On next week's show, we will be back once again at 8 p.m. Wednesday evening at twist.org slash live for our live broadcast. But if you cannot make it, that's all right, because it's all archived in our podcast, our RSS feed. You can find information about that at twist.org. You can also find links to subscribe to iTunes and Google Play at twist.org. And you can find our videos at our YouTube channel. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is, of course, also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile type device, you can look for Twist, the number four droid app in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website at www.twist.org. Also on our website is information about our live show in oh. Portland, Oregon. We will have special musical guests. Guests. I don't know what guests are. <laughs> the PDX broadsides. On, and that'll be on April 3rd at the Alberta Rose Theater. So go to twist.org for information on that. While you're there, you can also make comments. You can start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or if you don't like talking to those people, you can contact us directly at email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. 
otherwise your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter. We are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Yes, but if you've learned anything from the show, please remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to say the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy and this week in science is coming away so everybody listen to everything we say and if you use our methods instead of rolling a die we may rid the world of toxoplasma got the eye because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. All right, everyone. We have come once again to the end of our show. It's the end, don't you know? Which means it's the after show. Sigh and see, friends, the end of a wonderful science show. The end. What she said. Ah, we had it. it was a good one. I liked I liked today's show. It was fun. Yeah. It was it was it was. So I did a uh poll on Twitter Ooh. this last week about whether or not we should uh 
do change the the length of the show at all, whether I should mm. chop it up and turn it into two shorter shows, mm -hmm. whether we should make it like 90 minutes long, just make it one just slightly shorter show or just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, I, I, I didn't, there, it was very, uh, there was nothing significant <laughs> for a while there. Um, people are split though, between making it like a 90 minute show and just leaving the show alone. So. Hmm. So it's kind of interesting. We've got the people who are like, yeah, it's fine. I'm doing great. Interesting. Hot Rod, you ordered a calendar? I didn't see that come through. I apologize. I will make sure I will go look for that tomorrow and get it in the mail for you. I will check. I will check. I will check. I will check. Uh, I mean, I can check my email right now. Are we are we in the after show? We are in the after show, the show that happens after the show. I'm looking for the poll, but I'm just finding amazing other things <laughs> on your Twitter. <laughs> oh, my Twitter has fun yeah. things on it. Yes. And is Ra Raquel, are you still here? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Jump, in. <laughs> jump in. This is the after show. You're just, just lurking. To, okay. So the show, the show yeah. has officially ended, but we're okay. still live okay. in the post-show conversation -y part of the show. Okay. Yes, I was looking at the the poo actually because she mentioned the poo. I was looking at this now. <laughs> this ninety minutes or other options. Children's yeah, it's all. I mean, it's always, you know, try and figure out how to create the best show for people so that everybody's happy. And I've, you know, we've been having wonderful guests like yourself. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, should we have a cut it up so that there's a an interview podcast feed and then there's this the science news podcast feed and people can subscribe to each of them? Should I cut it up and have it so that the interview comes out on thursdays and the mm. news comes out on mondays mm. same feed but different uh different things should i just leave it alone should we instead of allowing the show to go as long as it goes <laughs> <laughs> clamp down on the conversation just a little bit and make it more a, a, so uh, you know a little more manageable is, this is also a i don't know if it's a, an open debate but it's obviously we have different perspectives we, you um, and I have yes. different perspectives. Yes. Absolutely. And so, but, but I, I look, I tend to look towards my own YouTube consumption. And if there's a three minute video, I don't want to click on it because I don't want to go for three minutes and then have an ad and then have it go into something else that I don't know what it's going to be. I'm more likely to tune into something that's really long form knowing that that's the content that's going to be on for a long time and i won't have to fuss with the electronic device to go no i didn't mean for you to rabbit hole me into something completely different that i'm not interested in i i i choose long form every time over short form when it comes to youtubering uh and at least in that in that format now it might be different for podcastering uh, listeners although i kind of suspect so can I can I say something about podcasts? Because I, I listen to podcasts probably like four hours a day. Um, I my sweet spot is for my listening is 45 minutes to is like an hour and 15. No, it's just because I don't know. It's a weird like I think it's a brainwave thing. But after about the 90 minute mark. I will start to lose interest no matter what it is. Okay. But but, but if but long, I will listen long form. But I will listen to six of the same 40 minute show in a row. Mm. 
but it's it's kind of the reset of the brainwave for some reason. And also the ability to be like, I finished that show, let me skip to another show that I enjoy and then skip back to this feed that I think is really valuable, which is why if we're gonna continue to do two hour shows, I think there also is something really cool about plopping down special editions when we do interviews midweek. I think there's something really cool about that. Like splitting it into two one hour yeah, so we like could still episodes. Yeah. It could still be one YouTube video potentially if we wanted, yeah. and just oh, yeah. in in the podcast feed, separate we would have, it. We would separate it. Yeah, I I kind of mm -hmm. like that. I, I, that that kind of makes sense to me. And, and then people you know, can get the news if they want, and they can like skip yeah. to the next. They can right. only do interviews if they want. Yeah. Or, so, yeah. and this is this is pretty cool idea. And it, I think YouTube has at least itself the capability of breaking it down. If you wanted to do that, um, no, it's all going to be me doing the editing after. Well, well, <laughs> afterwards. Well, my point is like uh, I, I think I think me and Blair are in agreement in terms of long form, whether it's an hour or two hour or. Who knows how long this after show goes? It could be a three hour podcast. <laughs> uh, but but uh, versus versus uh, we had talked in the past about segmentation down story by story, five minute thingies and that sort of thing. And I get there's a metric out there that helps with number of hits that you've gotten for number. I'm of not saying that anymore. I'm no, just no, trying no. Okay. to I'm just trying to hit the good. I'm just trying to hit the sweet, the sweet spot. spot. Yeah. I find that the two hour episodes, people listen. We people listen. They listen to about 60 percent of the episode. When the episode is closer to 90 minutes, we get more of 80 percent of the episode being listened to. But so, that's still more episode. <laughs> I mean, shorter. Yeah, so well, if 90 you did the minutes. Same. So if it's it's more ep the long people are listening to more of the episode if it's longer. But anyway, so uh, does that mean that on a on a normal week when we did not have an interview, we would just have a single drop and it would be like 90 minutes or less, right? And then really just 90 minutes. And then on a week that we had an interview, our show would end up being closer to two hours and we would have two 60 minute drops. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah. But it also depends like on that. the interview though, because sometimes an interview is 20 minutes. Raquel was really <laughs> riveting. I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so was the interview went it. much longer. So it's also like, then, then it's, then it becomes a ranking system of how interesting the interview was because all the 20 minute interviews, people are like, ah, it was a 20 minute interview. Why tune in? Must not have been interesting. Raquel, she was <laughs> on for like an hour. We've got to tune into that one. Right? Well, I mean, it doesn't mean it wasn't interesting. It means we got through what we wanted to talk about. Right. I don't know. So I, don't know. I think, I think uh, two things. Raquel's one of the longest interviews. And I think she's one of the fastest talkers. Oh, <laughs> that, that also means like the content was it's was huge. Right. So there is, but you're right, uh, Blair. It, it, there is an efficiency level in the interviews. As well. I can't, I can't wait to hear what people have who listen to the show on like two times, two and a half times speed oh in the podcast. They're gonna be like that interview. It was Time so fast. Down. It was good. Um, go down. So, so uh, this is and this is something that the uh, the the audience that's uh, still present missed because we talked about this in the pre-show. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Raquel came to us as a a recommendation of somebody you really have to interview by two um, two people I know, but sort but the the recommendations were disparate. They were separate recommendations. Uh, for this is, so this is how this became like a high priority to get you on the show this is, is, is yeah they are awesome two people two awesome people <laughs> well, and that sort of closed the circuit too yeah it's like the two two people who i admire told me that you were somebody that they admired and i'm like if these people admire her, we've definitely got to got to have her as as part of the show I'm glad they did. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I love it when people when people let us know who they think is going to be someone good to interview. And, so, you know, especially when people are like, 
she's one of my favorite people. It's like, oh, then this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to it's always good to get good recommendations from people. I love it. So, so here, okay. So you're also one of the few guests that we've had that hangs out into the after show. Oh, so, yeah. so. But I think that this is so obvious because I mean, I'm here. It's interesting. Of course, I would say. <laughs> but, but this is a rare opportunity <laughs> for us. Exactly. Yeah. This is a rare opportunity for us to ask you more questions. <laughs> How, no, to ask the guest how the interview was. Like, how did it? How did it feel to like jump into this thing that you've never heard of before and get up, throw in all these questions and, like, how was uh, how was I, the interviewee experience? It was. Uh, I think it was amazing. It was. I felt like hanging out with people uh, in a restaurant or in a bar and talking about things and science and and then because I stayed talking about other topics. And somehow interacted and, and and came back to the things that I said before and see connections and see interactions. I think you should always keep the the, the guests we encourage the show. It. We encourage it. Thankfully, you're here now on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. We have we have guests in other countries or on the East Coast. And by yeah. the time we just got to the end of the show. They were troopers. Then they're, you know, yeah. when they're up till one in the morning. I know, <laughs> so, I know. Yeah, so. if I were in Rio, I would be like, yeah, in the middle of the, yeah, yeah. In this case, of course, it's it's hard. But when they can, I think it's a good opportunity to get to a very different topic mm -hmm. and somehow find a way to connect to the other. And I think everything in science is just like that. And yeah, for so long though, it was science. I mean, it's getting more interdisciplinary yeah. and we have these connections and people looking for them between their, you know, their silos. Right. And yeah. it used to be these, you work on biology. So stay away from these other areas, right? Mm -hmm. You're in, you work on ocean science. So don't talk to these other people over here. But, yeah. At UC Davis, actually, I, I remember from grad school, it was really, uh, it was beneficial and it was actually something that was pushed that the, 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 the researchers were like, go talk to people in other departments. You need to go meet other people. Go to other brown bag seminars. Go find other collaborators. Uh, I think it's the opposite of, I mean, what we have now. Now we want mm. to actually hang out with people doing different things because you can have ideas, you can have, you can find things that you haven't thought about and that could fit your work or could be very beneficial. So, so I think everyone is encouraged to do that. There has been at the lab I work at, which cannot be mentioned, uh, <laughs> there has been a sort of unsiloing effort that's been, been taking place. Mm -hmm. And it's been at the time when I was introduced to the place and I, I've gotten to sort of watch it unfold over the last year and a half. And it's really, it's been fascinating because I've been in the room when two people from different departments or two groups of different departments got together to discuss a thing and realized how much either overlap or yeah. things yeah. that the other person was working on that they didn't even know existed. And yeah. it's been like, there's been a very sort of Renaissance feel uh, yeah. there lately uh, of people realizing the, the the they're part of this bigger picture and that they can contribute across departments and and part of like the, the departmentalization or the siloing has been a, a uh, in place for a reason meaning mm -hmm. you want to keep secrets close to the breast and not share with your your, your the, the next bench over because yeah. you don't want the, if they leave they could take some of this not but the unsiloing activities that have taken place have really pushed a lot of uh, possibilities forward that didn't even exist before. So it's been really fascinating to watch. I, I showed up at the absolute right time. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, this is my philosophy. Let's share. That's why I created the network. Let's share knowledge and protocols because if you wait them to be published, it's we're gonna we're not going to have. I mean, it's not about egos, who is going to actually do it first. It's about the chorus and the things that we want to happen to I mean. 
Yeah, that's an, that's and, an interesting point too, because there are huge egos in yeah. science and yes. they're in yes. some, you know, you, you go to some places and it's all about what they're going to do for science, not what, you know, how they can work with other people to move the field forward faster. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so it's just too, you, it's just too sometimes like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder though, if you're, you know, you're working on something, you know, corals and climate change related issues that, or at least, you know, these, these very time sensitive, yeah. Yeah. not just climate related, but just environment related issues. Mm -hmm. And so there's got to be more of an impetus to work together and not to have as much ego. Most of the people, most of the people. Maybe yeah. there's a correlation. Just correlation. Correlation. Maybe there's <laughs> a correlation <laughs> between uh, and it's, it's correlative and it's a suspect because I just came up with it on the fly. Maybe there is a correlation between the um, uh, number of women in science and the the sort of increase in decrease of ego. And the sharing of now, I wonder if this is. I wonder if this is one of the benefits of having more women in science, as the that there's less ego and more collaborative nature about it. Huh. Well, I think. I mean, it, it reminds me of something that's kind of been going on in the zoo and aquarium world recently. And I remember even you know I haven't been in the field that long, but I've been in the field for about twenty years now, and. That's a long time. Bro. Yeah. It's a mean, really long time. But by the way, 20 years, it's a really long time to be in the field. Anyway, in the in the in the short time that I've been in the field, um, <laughs> the things have shifted a lot from kind of competing for visitors, competing for visitor dollars, competing for um for uh kind of people's time yeah. to collaborating because there was this sudden realization that um, going to your facility doesn't prevent people from going to my facility. It actually increases the likelihood. So there's this there's this idea that like, oh, also, since ultimately we're trying to save the planet, uh, we can do that better if we unify our messaging. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this whole idea that that it was like, oh, I don't want to let you know what I'm doing because you might steal it and you might use it for your programs or, um, you know, I don't want to develop this very clear relationship with this other facility because we're actually we're we're competitors um but so there yeah there's this idea that actually we're all in this together so, and so, so we're, we're and sharing attempt, more way and, more than ever before and attempt to prove my point um in the 20 years you've been working in zoos are there more female zoologists in places of power that is a really good question. Um, probably. I think in the in education departments, it's probably not too different. Uh, education has been dominated by women in, across fields for, for a pretty long time. Information, right? um, but I know the zookeepers when, when I started there were probably 50-50 male-female, and now it's like 90% female at my institution. Um, it's yeah, I think the nonprofit sector in general is skewing more and more female. So maybe there is a correlation there. We Perhaps. don't know if it's cause or concept. No, I mean, I think that in my experience and my, my, my group of people, my, my environment, there are women and men that are very collabor collaborative and uh, all the others that have huge egos. Uh, I mean, I can't see a pattern in this sense, but maybe the way women work are more, not because we are nicer, but the way we work, it's more open because we need to get together because of the history and all the things that we had to fight against. We had to get united to actually make it. And then maybe we have this pattern that it's more open. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it's so hard. It's so it's hard, hard to, to yeah. say. Yeah. Or or the other. I mean, I've met women with huge egos who Yes, are not exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I've met men who are wonderful at collaborating. Exactly. You know, yeah. and the, you know, the other way around as well. And so, yeah, it's yeah. it's very hard to find a pattern. It's, yeah. Yeah, find the pattern among all amongst all the noise. But 
you know, the uh, the thing that I come back to is, you know, any ecosystem is better with more diversity. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Look see? at that. Yeah. <laughs> we always find a way to get back to the other topic. It's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> it's yeah. yeah. That's what I always say. Everything is connected. Uh, not only in uh, environmental sciences, but everything, everywhere. So, so somebody mm. in the chat room asks, uh, me to ask you who you would recommend uh, we interview. For an interview. Oh, Jonathan Eisen? Have it, uh, have yeah, we, Eisen need, we haven't. We actually need to get him on the show. Yeah, he's definitely a person to be invited and talk about all these things that we are discussing because he's the person who fights for minorities and inclusion and, and gender balance and all these things. It's quite interesting to hear his stories about the conferences that he actually go to the the website his website to 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 talk about gender balance and ask people not to attend some conference because it's only white mm -hmm. male dominated so i think he's a very interesting people person to talk about science and, and balance gender balance and minorities and also his uh, science science that is awesome so I jonathan his office might be walking distance from my office <laughs> what it might, it might be an easy introduction yeah, yeah. See, I I know Jonathan. I just need to send him an email. That is this is a good reminder yeah. that I just send the email. Get him yeah, on our. Yeah. So we have a recommendation Jonathan. based yes. on multiple recommendations to that recommend. <laughs> like this is how this chain works. Very similar. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonathan's amazing. There's also Harris Lewing here here at UC Davis, who's leading this Earth Bio uh, Biogenome Project. He's trying mm -hmm. to sequence all the genomes in the planet of. Uh, oh, what's his? What's it? What's that? Harris Lewin? He he used to be the vice provost of uh, science of research. Uh, he's oh. also a person to talk with. It's there you are. Super That's interesting. Cool. Yeah. I like interesting people doing interesting things. Yeah. Uh, chat room strengths. This is uh, already turned into two potential interviews. Good question. Yes. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will keep it going. Yeah. One thing that I think is so uh, the, the combination uh, in the last couple of decades of genomics and transcriptomics and, you know, the, along with microbiology mm -hmm. has just allowed it to explode. Yeah, like, definitely. I, I feel like we wouldn't be where we are if the, you know, if these two different worlds didn't come together. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and also uh, I I agree it's definitely a changing topic for us moment for us, but we mm -hmm. also need to at this time, I think balance a little bit of this knowledge that we have from the omics and the tools and also get back to the lab and run uh, experiments like I'm doing and others are doing like manipulating things and, and looking at the bugs and trying to get also answers in the real life. Like, you know, mm. all these mechanisms, but can we see this here? Can we use it? Can we uh, take advantage of all this knowledge or actually see this in the real life? I think both things have to go together to get along. Yeah. And Because yeah. I see that some people were just only moving to the side of the balance. And so we have all this data and data that we can't manage uh, oh, and is it? It's and it's insane. not the real world. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, 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 it's it's real it's world. But the problem is, the problem is yeah. we can now. This is this is what I do. Mm -hmm. I can do the human genome project over the weekend. Like, well, I'm not, cool. yeah. Set it up on a Friday, and when I come back on a Monday, I did the human genome amount of base calling. <laughs> now, question is. What does that mean? mean exactly. Absolutely nothing without testing. This yes, is the thing. that's my point. Yeah. That's my point. It's crucial. It's it's super interesting. It's I mean, it represents the the the, the this change, this advances that we have. But we need to actually learn how 
to test it, to use it, to prove it sometimes. And there's and it, and it is uh, so much data that it is at, on, on some level unusable mm -hmm. because it's so much. But on the other hand, once you start to drill down on mechanism, you can get you can really fine tune uh, mm -hmm. how a mechanism works like we've never been able to before. And so so there's 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 both sides of that, but we do need yeah. to we do need uh the the experimentation that's being done and uh, like like you're doing or in, in any lab setting that yes. gives a result to go and drill down on to, exactly. to figure out yeah to make, make. yeah you, you just can't it's not a blueprint yeah <laughs> yeah the, yeah the genome is not a blueprint of unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be fantastic. If it it would be amazing. Yeah. But basically, what it is, it's like a closed circuit video of everything that's happened every day over years. <laughs> and so <laughs> you just need to know what day meant something uh, to, to, to zero in on and see what that closed circuit TV, to follow this analogy, to see what event happened on that day. You need to uh, have something of of an event to to uh, drill down on mm -hmm. yeah and if you want a third indication of person to talk with maybe yeah. diane thompson who is the director of the biosphere 2 mm -hmm. ocean uh because she's actually preparing the ground for us to test several things and run these experimental tests yeah so this also is also woman this is the first I've heard of this because at first you're talking about the yeah. Uh, where else put an ocean but in Arizona? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm, like, I'm not like the best at geography, but I was like, yeah, yeah it's I, was like, I don't know if I would trust those people telling you to go <laughs> visit the ocean. In it. You I'm see, you see? Uh, this is the first I've heard of this project, so this uh, opened my eyes to that. That's that's yeah. gonna be. Really it was originally, I don't know if you if you had never heard about this project, the Biosphere 2 itself, it was uh, designed to mm -hmm. test like if it could build a structure that could be all uh, self-sustained and be built in the future in Mars. Yeah. And then the concrete yes. like, sucked out all the oxygen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> calculated it did not oxygen. work. Yeah, it, it did not work because of how much oxygen the, the concrete that they put within they, the structure was going to pull out, and people were like, I'm getting dizzy in here. I'm get, no, they have a, a very interesting lung in the, in, the, in the system. It's quite interesting, but it didn't work for several reasons, including CO2, but they could have actually managed that. But especially people and clouds uh, together are not always easy to handle. Psychological. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the good thing is that they have this amazing structure where they have some ecosystems reproduced. So they have tropical forests, a mangrove, uh, this largest artificial ocean uh, in the world. They had a reef there in the past, uh, and they I, I don't know if they stopped using it or looking after it and so now we have this degraded area and the idea is to build this reef from scratch back to this ocean and have the ways and the knowledge of having this resilient reef being built and then test things and i think that diane thompson who's leading this project it's a very interesting person to talk with because she can talk more about the biosphere itself and other interesting things she's super fun i think you guys would love her I would love that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I love it. I'm trying to do two. I'm multitasking. Oh, always yeah, multitasking after the show. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I need to get. Maybe we all need to just go to Arizona. Oh, road trip in a bus. <laughs> road trip, yeah. So we can either take your school bus, Justin, after you get it fixed up a little bit, or um, if we can, if Marshall ever gets our our V fixed, then we could we can take our Airstream. Nice. We it's will do both. Caravan. Caravan. That's right. And we'll camp out along the way, and we'll go to places that have fossils, 
and interesting geologic structures, ecological uh, ecological preserves. Totally in. Right? <laughs> Science road trip <laughs> to go meet the people who are doing Biosphere 2. Yeah. To, There's to hang every, out in the ocean in the med, middle of the desert. desert. In the middle yeah. of the desert. Yeah. You can stay there. There are some casitas. Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting. I think it's worth a visit. I would love to check that out. I, I wonder if they've got it on Airbnb. I feel like I'd like to reserve. It's very, very, I mean, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. So yeah. there's a small place. I think it's Oracle. That is the closest mm. place. Of course, they, they should have Airbnb, but you can also stay there. It's quite interesting. So, yeah. so in somewhere in the rundown, uh, you're a visiting professor? I'm visiting here in Davis. I'm, I'm, I have my position in Brazil. So I'm in a scientific mission. So I'm, I'm here for three years. Now I'm in the middle of the, my, my this, the scientific mission term. So, okay. but I go back and forth. I'm going to Rio in April now. Because I was wondering, because you, you mentioned you knew one of my uh, cohorts for like 12 months. You worked in the same lab. So then I'm like, how can you be visiting if it's already been a year? And you're still, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, because I go back. I mean, I keep my lab there. Most of my students, I have 15 students there. Okay. So uh, they are, uh, we have, I mean, Sky meetings every day. We have all this technology to take advantage of. So it, they feel like I'm there and I go there very often too. So okay. things are moving forward. So so you're really at you're you're currently working at basically at two universities, or is the yes. other the the yeah, okay. I'm here and there. I usually I spend my morning there because I go to the lab here, but I have meetings and because they are five years ahead, hours ahead. So mm -hmm. I have here in their morning. afternoon. Yeah. And then I spend my afternoon here. Oh, that's so yeah. Wild. yeah. Yeah. Are you running? Are you managing your lab there while you're also? Yeah. It's crazy, doing... right? Yeah. That's a lot of work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It is. I know. And I'm, sometimes I think, oh, my God, how can I do that? But I have an amazing team there. Some yeah. people that are with me for a very long time, and they actually are the – I have a lab manager and people yeah. that actually take care of it. Of course, I have to be on it. And yeah. we – I mean, you talk every day about everything's happening, but I, I have this amazing team. I'm really lucky. That's great. You're not lucky. You are you are lucky, but at the same time, you put it together. I mean, yeah. you brought the people together. Yeah. Yes. You also, you know, you attracted great people to you and were able to, you know, pick people that you were like, these I want I want to work with these people. They're great. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing. And it's I mean, when you have this atmosphere, I think it attracts more nice people. And so the not very nice people don't feel very well don't get along and they <laughs> naturally get exclude <laughs> and don't come along <laughs> like the ant no you're not nice no don't come along <laughs> <Stay there. laughs> not at this spider the ant spider right spider yeah. ant yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking in the chat room to see if there's if there's question, oh, Dave Shorty is wondering if there's uh, computer computer modeling and number crunching that's involved in the if there's if there's any plan to do any machine learning and computer modeling based on the probiotics work and the interdependence. Yes, I I trying to find time to meet. Marisa Basket, who's here at UC Davis, she's the one running some kind of modeling and, and approaches mm -hmm. like that. And I definitely want to bring this in. It's the next step. The, the next step. Yeah. Yeah. The strength of it. Here. The, yeah. Yes, right here. Yeah. <laughs> Just go walk down, walk, 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 walk across campus. Say exactly. Hello. The kind. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. We've been in touch and we we have discussed the, some ideas and, and uh, in, the, in the past, and that we should get it. I mean, together and find time to talk about potential ideas, and I really need to do that. Yes, F with all your spare time. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> like now, <laughs> uh, after midnight, uh, between midnight and 6 a.m. And the kids have three. And I actually have two kids because one is 21 years old boy, so oh it's not goodness. a kid anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's not That's a kid an adult. Anymore. <laughs> it's another he's in Rio, so he's in college. So wow, yeah, yeah. Do you have uh, do you uh, do you have any other? Is that your only child, or do you? Have no, other... I have three. I have a uh, six years old boy and a uh, oh fifteen God. years old girl. And are they with you? In... They are here in Davis. In yeah, Davis. In oh. Davis. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Super adapt. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a that's amazing. Yeah, that's really it's cool, though. I mean, exactly. you were able to work it out. I mean, that's one thing, uh, you know, between so kids sad. and I have yeah. an eight year old son. And it, it, sometimes I'm like, man, you know, could I go do something? He has to stay in school. What do I do? You know, but it, you know, some you, kids are adaptable and you just go. Exactly. do. Yeah. 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 He, when he arrived, he couldn't say a word in English. And now he's kind of a leader of the group, <laughs> the team after awesome. one year and a half. They're adaptable, yeah. And it's a very good experience. It's an invaluable experience for them. Not only in terms of having this second language that it's a fluent language for them, but also the experience, the cultural mm -hmm. experience. It's, I mean, there's something else outside my small box. Yeah. 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 Open and mind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah, traveling the world, going different places and experiencing other people and other cultures is always a way to open you, open yourself up to new perspectives. Yeah. Exactly. You can do that while yeah. you're young. And yeah. if, if, you're a, if you're a mother of three children and running two different labs. And two different I know. <laughs> I know. I am. I am it's impressed. Crazy. I, it's crazy. Sometimes <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> But no, I'm not. I'm not running two different labs because here I'm. I'm. I'm a guest. Doing right. So yeah, I have some students with Jonathan, but uh, he's the one. Professor. Yeah, yes. I'm visiting. So I love visiting. Professor responsibilities. Yeah. Nothing more than that. Nothing like, okay. more. So <laughs> next time I wake up and I've got like nothing on my plate that I actually have to do, <laughs> but a couple of things that I probably should get done. Raquel, I'm going to think you'd be like, okay. <laughs> I think somebody with a lot more on their plate who's getting it done. I should just probably, I should just probably do what I need to get done. <laughs> there's no date when I wake up and say there's nothing on my plate. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I have, yes, I have yes. those, well, no, I have those mornings where there's like a couple of things I probably should get done today, mm -hmm. but but that's like the that's usually the most fierce i get hit with <laughs> yes. it's crazy it's crazy yeah i just i i the only thing i need to do now is to save the world no no i'm just kidding <laughs> but you're not like you're saying that very lightly but i hope like you're very successful in what you're doing i hope that too. i hope you're very successful <laughs> in pursuit uh because I have now seen how it ties into the absolute global health of our planet. And, and we've had a fun, light conversation, but there's part of me that's like, we need to dedicate a large percentage of the resources of the planet. To to the the <laughs> because <laughs> it, like, if nobody else has figured this out yet, this is the most important thing that could be being worked on right now because it has implications across all of the things that are going to impact over the next generation. Yeah. Seriously. There is a very interesting work in Australia where they show that corals can, can build some, some umbrellas to protect them when they are very stressed. And so they, we know that they produce some uh, organisms living in the corals. They produce some compounds that can attract uh, humidity and form clouds. So they can do that when they are stressed, which would be amazing. So, but the implications are that that could change a little bit the local regime of sh of rains, and it can mm -hmm. attract rains that would be in the terrestrial areas. So agriculture could suffer from it. So. Things are all connected, and that's why it's so. Uh, the, I, 
people, some people used to say that corals are the, the canneries and the, the coal mining. So they are the first, that, but it doesn't mean that other ecosystems are not threatened. So the key thing is the, the CO2 emissions, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we are always so, getting back to that. Yeah, of so course. Least, then I guess if there's suddenly like decent rainfall in Arizona, <laughs> for the artificial ocean. <laughs> like, so this becomes a farming tool, right? Like now, well, except for the first before. 50 or 100 years, it'll just push silt off of the road if it's in a place that doesn't normally get rain is the problem. I, I was a pro, I was, I, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> But uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, a half wine barrels that I was using as planters. Oh, fun. And we had, we were, we, uh, Raquel was here for this. We had a monsoon rainfall today. And it turns out that uh, wine when barrels, atmospheric rivers. Yeah. yeah. Wine barrels are very good at uh, retaining water. That makes so sense. Like planters. pickle barrels, right? Pickle barrels, yeah. I had these, I had these uh, planters that were the full of they're full of wildflowers that have just started growing. Drowned so, them, drowned them to hell. All drowning. <laughs> so, uh, so I had to go out and pick a drill and drill all these holes in the wine, and they, it was like almost like a cartoon. Like they were like, like these channels of water were like spitting out of this barrel like psh, like it had been shot up by um i so said i've lost the thread of what it was oh <laughs> but, <laughs> um but yeah like uh, the, it's, it's a bit of the too much of the good thing like you want the rain uh for the plants and everything else and everything but then it's like suddenly now you're you're in, now I'm flooding these these and it was gonna kill all these little seedlings. So yeah, again, I get I well it's after a fire season in California. Then if you get heavy rains, you get mudslides. Yeah. 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 As we so, are having uh, have flooding and yeah. things like crazy things happening in Davis, you know. It's yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So though, if we if we if we follow this though, uh, there there may be there may be the global fisheries uh, that have a stake in this. There may be oxygen on the planet, and which then translates into agriculture and every human in every form of life on the planet. Uh, seriously, like how like how many? industries like how how far away are we from industries tapping into understanding the connection and funding this research like how hard is it to get the funding for this research versus how many things did it impact in in the case of the curls and then the it's you know it's it sounds that it should be very easy to get funding but it's not mm. that easy at all i mean i've got now a very good funding from shell or a company because we are stud because we have some laws in brazil that they have to invest money in basic research and they are really concerned about the deep sea cores and things so i've got this good funding from them and i've got a an award from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. But I, I sometimes people think like, people say that, oh, you are probably swimming in money and funding because this yeah. research is so cool. But it's not like that. We need a lot of money to do. I mean, we have several work that we have started, but we don't know yet how we're gonna uh, analyze the, 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 the DNA or the RNA out of it. And so we are still trying to find more funding for it. It's not that easy. I don't know. If I don't know the right people, <laughs> or, or I don't know. I mean, it's not that easy. I think, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, there, there's limited funds in the research world, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. definitely less on the whole than there should be for yeah, various yeah. reasons. But I think there's always... And this is something that we talk about in, um, in environmental science and, and conservation education, too, is that, like, 
medicine and technology will always get first dibs. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah even yeah. though this kind of stuff is super duper important and, you yeah. know, it doesn't really matter what technology you have if the earth cannot sustain us. Exactly. So, like, That's what I think. so yeah, it's kind yeah. of, it's pretty important, but yeah. people, I mean, it's, it's the immediate gain versus exactly. the long-term gain, exactly. right? The then, immediate gain is always going to win out. It yeah, that's does. exactly what happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. And there are lots of other uh, strategies and solutions that have been studied, like the breeding of uh, resistant colors and other things mm -hmm. that get some funding, but I think it's still not enough to... I saw something about... Uh... Was it low electrical current? Um, like these these grid wires put down and low electrical current being able to attract the 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 startings of coral reefs. You know what I'm talking about? No, no, oh, okay. no. This is pretty. I mean, there are lots of other things that people have tried. Like some people think that they can shadow the reef with some, mm -hmm. some compounds in the water, uh, but there are always uh, bright side and downsides of everything. Like you can you can shadow, but then they still need light and how to actually balance it. And so there are several. There is a very very interesting uh, document uh, from the National Academy of Science that was published last October. Uh, October 2018, uh, discussing the solutions, the interventions that could be uh, the, actually the tools that we think that we have. And I remember that during the presentation of the document, the chair of this uh, committee, uh, Steve Palubi, he said that we have the tools, uh, the, the toolbox is full of things, but he actually don't know exactly how to use them. So, uh, but it's interesting because the document lists some some of these ideas, some of these um, things that are out there, and uh, the the pros and cons and the limitations and where we are in, uh, for all of them. I think it's a very interesting reading, uh, and I was lucky to be one of the reviewers, and I was kind of oh my gosh, I can stop reading it because it's so well uh, written and it's quite informative. It's Something that I recommend. Full of crazy and new ideas, full of ideas that are more like, that have more data. But yeah. uh, that's what we need big, crazy ideas. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. what we had yeah. this workshop at the Biosphere 2, mm -hmm. and one of the, the people there said, uh, how can we go crazy because otherwise i'm i'm out <laughs> because i mean we need to go crazy now <laughs> yeah that's perfect let's come yeah. up with all the crazy ideas the craziest yeah. ideas and see which exactly. you, which ones so stick because, which ones work like we're talking about as a crazy idea but we sort of also like you know 70 percent of the planet is ocean uh and we've talked to other people who who are focused on ocean health in the past and and one of the things that sort of just always uh, i guess i'm starting to get this picture of like we just mentioned uh finance going to medical health <laughs> as though you know as though it's 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 just within the body but it's almost as the the entire environment that we live in is mm -hmm. the ocean oh and absolutely sort of yeah ourselves as terrestrially focused about all of our concerns terrestrially most of the planet is ocean this is the environment that the lens to the atmosphere that uh, that we exist in. And it's as if we're completely ignoring the environment that our organism, our terrestrial organism is in uh, and so focused on that internal that we're. Yeah. So. I wonder I wonder if we're going to be able to get to that point. And I think Blair does. Uh, brings a lot of, of of stories and is engaged in a lot of outreach in that subject. And it sounds like your research is completely focused in this direction too. Uh, so Blair, Rekha, how do we get the rest of the planet to understand that the environment that they live in is the ocean and atmosphere? So um, the the social science research that that I have 
seen and that has been used to develop the communication tools that that I use through the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. Um, it's it's a lot. I mean, I'm just wrapping up right now a five month training that that I led for Bay Area science communicators. Um, but to boil it down to a couple of main points, um, you can't be lecturing at people. It has to be a conversation. You have to meet them where they are. You have mm -hmm. to uh, start with a shared value and it can't be an intrinsic value. So you have to meet people in a space where, where it becomes relevant. Um, and in the, case, in the case of climate change, the two values that they found tested across demographics, across ages, across all of the United States at least, um, was the value of protection and the value of responsible management. So if you can use one of those as kind of the reason to key in to the conversation, it becomes pressing, it becomes important, it becomes part of current and future generations well-being um, and then you need to make sure to focus on solutions that are local so you can't talk too big because then people get stuck in the politics as usual yes. mire uh, so it has to be local it has to be achievable and it has to be a community level solution because if it's an individual solution people have their checklist they've done their one and done or they feel like they have the weight of the world on their back. And in either situation, people become disengaged over time. So if it is a community level solution where they are working together, then it's actually the right um, scope to actually make a difference, which is the really important thing, right? We can't just mm -hmm. make people think they're making a difference. They actually have to be making a measurable impact, but also that it feels as big as the problem. So that's like the two minute Wait. version. <laughs> but, cool. Yeah. But I mean, the bottom line is hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hope is the bottom line. Because if, if it does not feel like there is hope to be had, um, then, then smoke them while you got them. Yeah. I have the feeling <laughs> that <laughs> when I go to conference, I have the feeling that people get it get really into my talk because we go to these conferences and we only see bad news. Curves mm -hmm. are being decimated. Uh, the predictions say that they can go extinct and this and that. And then I, I come and show the results that I got with our probiotics and people get so into the talk. And I think it's just because of this. It's just because it's hope. It's you hope, know, it's a solution. It's, yeah. yeah but it's very small. Like it was, I mean, I used to present the first uh attempt to do that so it's tank uh level we have to do several things we don't know if it's going to work in the field so it's like when when you, you discover a cure for one disease and then you have to go through all this process from the lab to the mice to the to the to the apps and then the humans and so we are still there in the lab and and but it's hope it's hope. it's hope. Yeah. And then like excitement. And so yeah. one, one thing that um, Penn State did in, in conjunction with um, Noki in relation to this kind of hope I, versus this crisis or fear or, or idea is that um, hope actually creates more urgency to get to that potential better tomorrow. So it actually makes people more likely to act soon on the 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 pro on future prospects, whereas um, fear and crisis actually um, shut down creativity, which I think is so funny. Yes. Um, and it uh, it makes people feel kind of hopeless and helpless and isolated. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, it's pretty interesting that that social science is something. I mean, speaking of multiple. Um, disciplines like we were before, I feel like social science was kind of isolated from some of the harder yeah. sciences for a very long time. And this is a perfect example where social science can actually work hand in hand with the real climate science to figure out how to communicate what has been found and, and, and what it means, which yeah. is but, so cool. But interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, this was no surprise to the hard science. It was just the communication side that was like, you mean we could we could we could communicate something that was truth, that was already that was a real thing, and convince people of a thing that's true? Yeah, that 
that's a thing that's an application for communication i had no idea yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that there's tactics, there's tactics. Like the the original kind of knee jerk to some of this stuff was, I don't want to sound like a politician. Mm. And that's something that I've heard from scientists before. The, the scientists have said, I'm impartial. I don't want to spin, right? But that's not really what this is. It's more just making sure um, that you're filling kind of these cognitive holes, that um, that you're meeting people where they are and, and you're ready to have kind of a conversation with, with hopefulness and uh, and and kind of this this picture of of working hand in hand, like the part of it also is recognizing that it's not you're burning the fossil fuels. It's not I'm burning the fossil fuels. It's yeah. we use fossil fuels for these things that we depend on. How can we continue to get the things that we need while shifting away from the fossil fuels, right? Because like when I started in a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff, I felt like a jerk for driving a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was this very, it was this initial hurdle that was kind of hard where one of the people leading my study circle where I started learning this stuff said, no, 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 you're not the bad guy here. If you need to drive your car to work, that's not your fault. That's the system's fault. So we need to figure out how as a community to change, change the, the way system. cars work or make public transportation better or make it so people live closer to their jobs. And that is on all of us to ask our civic leaders to do that. Exactly. It, and it's possible. It's not something yeah. unachievable. It's something that we can do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, but. It's most good impossible. things, most good things we have now, you know, civil rights, <laughs> things like that. They were hard. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly what I think. And it's, and it's not done. So we're still working on it. Yeah, but it sure is worth it. So you know, gender equality. We're 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 climbing that mountain. We're not done, but it sure is better than it was fifty years ago. And it was it was a it was a hard track to get here, but. And hey, I'm fighting. Okay. I'm fighting that uh, for that too, because like I can't wait till it comes full circle and men aren't allowed to work. <laughs> <I know. laughs> As men aren't like really accepted in the workplace, and we're like, Shh. well, here's the thing, Justin. Uh, then we need to fix the economy because right now everybody needs to work. No, no, this is this yeah. is exactly this is exactly what fixes it. As soon as men aren't allowed to work, there'll be less people in the workplace, which means incomes will be driven oh, higher right. because they can't hire men to do a woman's job. They just wouldn't be any uh, good at it. And so we now like honestly have big competition. This is gosh. gonna it's gonna fix everything. As soon as that men that's my dream come true. I wanna I wanna go to work. I want my husband to stay home. That's absolutely yeah. what I want. Yeah. This is this is, will make for a better society too. I want to come home to a hot meal. <laughs> <That's what I> <laughs> <want>. <laughs> It'd be so good. <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, we do we do have different ways like of of attempting to inspire people on the uh, urgency of things. Uh, because I have been telling people for years, smoke them while you got them. Oh boy. All lost. <laughs> We have doomed the planet. There's no going back. And yeah, it's all over. Well, the science tells us that, that that is a, an unproductive way to start a climate change conversation. Well, well it, I do it in a little Columbo <laughs> way. Because then I come back and I go, one question though. If you did want your children's children to be on the planet, uh -huh. Is it possible you'd be willing to recycle and maybe? Well, I do not. I, I do not have any social science data on the effectiveness of snark. So, um, <laughs> jury's out on that. I do. Snark is not effective. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's amongst those who appreciate snark. I think that you're right, though. It does take a uh, multifaceted. It's almost like you needed a diversity of approaches uh, to, there you to go. affect a healthy outcome. Yeah. Mm. Yeah.
Well, I mean, the the good news from from my side of things is that um, the Noki process has trained over 400 people across the United States in mm -hmm. almost, I think it's 250 sci informal science learning centers. So that's zoos, aquariums, museums, national parks, state parks, awesome. et cetera, et cetera. And all of them are trained to train their staff, which means there are all these sites. I've done... Uh, one day, two day workshops around the Bay Area for other organizations. So there's all these people, there's this ripple effect happening. And in theory, this, this unified narrative will start to permeate through at least the United States. That would be, that's step one in, in taking over the world from my standpoint. Um, but that's really, my sphere of influence. We're the worst but. country at these having these conversations. And exactly. so, yeah. I mean, everywhere else in the world, they're already signed on to the yep. Copenhagen mm -hmm. Treaty. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's just us. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. some countries want to get out of it too. Some countries yeah. now have new governments that also want to. Yeah. But so, I mean, also, yeah. America is a trendsetter for a lot of these things. So how can we expect other countries to to want to join in w without us on? I, I mean, like, it is a reality. There is a reality that America is um, is a trendsetter in certain areas. Economically, there's other things, too. And so having America as one of the... Um, one of the supporters of things like this is influential on the global exactly. stage. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I, uh, for those in the audience who aren't aware, I am not actually an American. Uh, I'm, I'm a Californian. <laughs> uh, and I know California is part of the, uh, American Union, um, <laughs> on some sort of political level. But at the core, I am just a Californian. And, and as a Californian, I feel like my country has been taking the right steps uh, historically and ahead of the curve and over and over again. Um, and it is the rest of this uh, union that uh, uh, somewhat of, uh, much of it uh, uh, that does need help uh, understanding the, 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 the global impacts of, of what we're involved in. But. But I don't I don't feel I don't feel like uh, politically uh, or, or governmentally I'm misrepresented by by my Californian uh, government. I, I feel like. They yeah. Well, and, and as much as America can be a thought leader and a trendsetter in the global stage, California is a thought leader and a trendsetter in the uh countrywide stage in a lot of ways. I mean, our economy alone means that there's certain states that are going to have to jump on the bandwagon or be left behind. So well-meaning well states like we have an environmental policy that regardless of what uh, California does through emission uh, standards on vehicles or in uh, industrial pollution standards, there's, I think it's 13 or 16 other states that just rubber stamp it. They say, mm -hmm. like, you know, we're not going to put in the, 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 the resources to study how you got to that. We're not going to try to recreate it. Uh, if you did it, California, yeah, good enough. We're just going to repeat. Which is why there was a point when vehicles were being manufactured with different emission standards. Yeah. In different states, depending on where they were sold. And at some point, California became so influential that they just went, you know what? We're going to build everything to the California standard. Yeah. And that for that way, it actually is less expensive because we have a... Because you don't have to have a bunch of different ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, we it's, a, it's like the textbooks, right? There's a Texas edition and a California edition, yes. and that's it. Different. And it's the same yeah. Subject. That's so crazy. But, but that, I mean, that's a good example of how you know california can be a trendsetter in a lot of ways and i mean the last the last uh kind of regional not regional what's the opposite of that uh national meeting that i went to uh with noki was in texas and there were people there from texas and florida in the network and they shared some interesting adjustments and changes and progress that's happening in Texas and Florida, which is very cool. But ultimately, they also said that they, as climate change um, champions in their state, where sometimes it kind of feels like going against the grain, 
they often look to California to feel inspired and to see kind of the road ahead, which is pretty cool. Um, I had a very opposite reaction where I saw what Florida and Texas were doing, and it started to feel like the weight was lifted a little bit off of California and some of the other states that are trying to do it because they are getting with the program. Right. There is a difference um, in there's there's a benefit to green energy, no matter what your um, agenda may be on this particular issue. There is a rising benefit um, economically, logistically, um, all of that kind of stuff, healthcare of workers, et cetera, et cetera in that. And so more and more areas are starting to recognize that and make the right decisions. Who cares if it's for the right reason? <laughs> That's the idea, right? You want to make the mm -hmm. better decision, the easier one. Yeah, so, there you go. It's I have hope. <laughs> I do have hope too. Yay. I have to. I have three kids. I have of to. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I need this. More <laughs> I mean, long term thinking. I couldn't yeah. go to work if I didn't have hope. Exactly. How would I talk to a class full of second graders about habitat destruction and climate change and the pet mm -hmm. trade? And mm -hmm. if I didn't think that it could be fixed. Exactly. Yeah. I also have three kids. And one thing I've noticed about all three of my kids is that they're much more uh, uh, intelligent, mature, and concerned with the world that they're in than I was at their ages. Oh, yes. yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And the bad side is that we are actually living this not very well maintained world for them. And they would suffer the consequences yeah. of our decisions. Well, the cool thing is they're already kind of demanding better they're yeah. not even voting age yet and there's so many groups and they're standing up groups saying, that nope. are yeah yep. saying excuse me i don't care that i'm not old enough to vote you still represent me and work for me yeah this is awesome yeah, yeah. of the movement in australia in greta and all these amazing kids yeah way more mature than yeah pretty cool so mature. I'm getting tired. Mm -hmm. It's bedtime. Uh, yes. You should say goodnight. I should say goodnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yes. I am realizing I have I have website things to clean up. I've, there are so many things to constantly do. Do do yes. do. I know. Six, six, six. Yeah. <laughs> Raquel, it was very nice meeting yeah. you. Yes, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thanks for hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sure. hanging out. That is yeah, the best. That's yeah. the best. Yeah, let's hang out also here in Davis. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only one actually here, but uh, I know two of your friends. So. Yes, so <laughs> let's hang out. Yeah, okay. let's definitely do that. Awesome. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank good you. Night, Raquel. Blair, Thank you. Good night. Say good, night. good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <laughs> Good night, Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. I will be at my Twitch stream on Friday at 1 p.m. Twitch.tv slash Dr. Kiki. And we'll be back here next Wednesday for more great science fun. We hope to see you then. Thank you for joining us. Where's Thank the off you. button? Find it. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank Good you, Raquel. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Bye.